I, I can legitimately say hip hop saved my life because of the stories I shared with you earlier. Um, and so I'm, for that reason, I'm, I'm incredibly protective of it. I'm very possessive of hip hop because hip hop was for us as disenfranchised, oppressed people as a, as a form of communication, as an art form for us to overcome those oppressions. It wasn't meant to be selling, uh, you know, sneakers and, and Pepsi ads, like the way that corporations co-opted hip hop is absolutely heartbreaking to me. And so when people think about hip hop and, you know, what it is and what the image is, you know, it's, it's one aspect of it. And it's not the one that I feel like is the best representation of us as people. Welcome to episode eight of the Enculturation Podcast, where we make learning about the world fun, engaging, and accessible, helping you stay tuned, stay curious. Eric Carter Chu is an Afro-Chinese indigenous DJ, educator, and community event organizer. He earned his BA in sociology and ethnic studies at the University of Hawaii. He also holds two master's degrees in social justice education from San Francisco State University and University of California, Santa Cruz. In addition, he has studied foreign language at Beijing University and Konan University in Kobe, Japan, as well as being a UCLA Writing Project Fellow. Eric, also known as Black Soap, has been a resident DJ for Open House Family since 2015, and he's the co-founder of Soul Source, one of the premier monthly dance parties in Los Angeles. As a public high school teacher in the San Francisco Bay Area, his focus is on teaching youth through the word and the world by incorporating social emotional health, music, film, and creative writing into his curriculum. He has piloted courses in sociology and ethnic studies in Oakland and Los Angeles Unified School District, and is currently teaching in an intensive therapeutic program in Palo Alto. His diverse living experiences are reflected in not only his perspectives as an educator, but also in his sound as a DJ. He is known to have a signature eclectic and deep sound ranging from hip hop, soul, funk, jazz, house, drum and bass, and worldly influences. Welcome, Eric. What up, man? Good to see you, man. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate you uh, you being here and taking the time out of your day and um, really just being vulnerable and open enough to share uh, your worldly experiences. Thanks, man. No, I'm really grateful to be here and. Um, just yeah, share stories today. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so uh, let's 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 start with your background. You know, like tell tell me how you got to where you are from, like either the source source uh, path or the education path. Hmm. I mean, I I think when it comes to um, music and and uh, me my role as an educator, it really does come down to my parents, and um, you know when I was kind of reflecting on what brought me to the moments that I'm experiencing today, it's like thinking about my mom who's an immigrant. Um, actually she's a, an orphan from Hong Kong and, um, kind of understanding how, you know, what it means to be an orphan and then, um, kind of going through the world, not having a connection to your past and how that has informed what I do through music and why I became an educator. Um, and, uh, similar with my father being from Mississippi, um, being growing up in the deep south, um, going to segregated schools, um, not graduating from school himself, being illiterate, um, and his journey through music and his struggles with education, um, and how that sort of led me to becoming a teacher as well and becoming a DJ. So, uh, I definitely want to spend some time unpacking that a little bit more, but, um, but yeah, I think my story, um, absolutely starts with my parents who are, um, Afro Asian and, um, and yeah, so all that kind of informs my journey. Yeah, uh, I would love to unpack it. So I, I guess I'll, I'll follow your lead on where to where to start with unpacking. Yeah, I mean, as I was mentioning, um, my mom, uh, you know, she she was an orphan and uh, she got brought to the United States when she was six years old. And uh, growing up, um, you know, she was she had a Chinese name when she came here, um, but then when they brought her here through that process of Americanization. Um, they had her change her name and uh, they taught her English. She doesn't know Chinese anymore. Um, and she grew up in a, a, you know, a German and Italian immigrant household in Los Angeles. And so her navigating through school and, um, you know, the struggles that she had, she was actually in special ed um, because at the time they didn't have, you know, ELD programs. So even the notion of, you know, someone being different in the school system kind of 
supplant you in special ed programs. And that was happening in the 1960s. And that's still in many ways happening today um, with students of color being, you know, sort of um, disproportionately placed in special ed classrooms. Um, and that's what I'm teaching right now, which is full circle. So, um, and yeah, so my mother growing up with uh, essentially white, um, with white parents. Um, and then when she met my father, my father, um, He's from Mississippi. Um, he's from Greenville, Mississippi, which, as we know, is the heart of, of slavery in America. And my father, um, you know, he went to segregated schools. Um, you know, he or my family practiced sharecropping, um, slavery, obviously. And, uh, you know, my father didn't end up graduating from high school. And, uh, you know, and he passed away maybe 10 years ago. And till the day he died, he was still illiterate. And um, so for me to make it through, you know, have those, uh, have my parents have those experiences with school, um, and then for me to eventually become a teacher, um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot that, that kind of happened, even just for me to, to be, you know, to exist in the world. And um, as I was mentioning too as well, my, my grandparents, my mother's grandparents didn't accept my father um, for him being black. So there were um, issues with race rampant even there you know and so uh, one of the things that my my grandparents told my mother was that um you know why are you dating a black person you know like what kind of um kids are you going to bring into the world you know and one of the funny things that they said was um they were like they're not going to have any friends and they're going to look like samoans and again keep this in mind early 1970s early to mid 1970s and just a lot of ignorance and unawareness. Um, but, uh, but lo and behold, my, I have, you know, two brothers, um, and we were, we were born and we did manage to have friends. And eventually we, we became these people that, um, you know, like I, I we do, we do, I'm really proud of my brothers. My, my younger brother is an automotive engineer and my older brother is an automotive journalist. And, um, I'm a teacher and a DJ and we just defied so many odds to get to where we're at today. Um, especially in a world that wasn't, trying to accept us for who we are, being Afro-Asian. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think those experiences definitely fuel why I became a teacher and a DJ. <laughs> yeah, uh, do you think the similarities between being a DJ and a teacher, uh, as far as like kind of presenting information or educating the crowd or your students rather? Yeah, I mean, I, I well, you know, going back even a little bit further, um, you know, most of my graduate and academic, you know, my bachelor's work was on the, the intersection of hip hop and literacy. Um, and I, I, I personally, um, without trying to get too far ahead, um, I didn't graduate from high school either. And I became a high school teacher. But what was my teacher from this from, you know, what I felt like was my one of my first teachers was music, um, specifically hip hop, and how I learned about um, the world through hip hop, and how that um, was informing me in school as an educator and as a learner. And then when I started DJing, it's kind of the same thing in terms of educating people on culture and educating people on history through music. Um, and yeah, there, there's a lot of things uh, you brought up that's so interesting that I wanna get back to it. Um, one of which I think it's important to kind of give clarity on what kind of hip hop that you're listening to, right? Because mm. I think depending on the generation that you were born in, people today might have a completely different understanding of what hip hop is. So let's speak about like which uh, either, yeah, what, what layer, what tier or what generation of hip hop you're talking about, you know? So I was in high school in the nineties. So yeah. I listened to Golden Era, Boom Bap hip hop. Um, yeah. But that's not how, that's not, that was not my first introduction to hip hop. Yeah. Um, I was listening to Snoop and um, kind of radio, radio stuff at the time, 92, like Snoop, Snoop drops. And, uh, and that was probably one of the first CDs I had listened to Ice Cube. And there's definitely like a lot of consciousness, especially in that Ice Cube, the Ice Cube albums. But I was a kid, I was listening to hip hop because I thought it was gangster and I was trying to find an identity um, as a young adolescent. But um, I'll never forget get the moment that I feel like hip hop literally changed my life. And it was, um, I think I was about 16 years old and I was going to, you know, back in the day it was the, the record shop and I was buying, I, I had this kind of ritual of buying CDs every Tuesday when they dropped. And, um, you know, I'd save my, my, my lunch money to get to the, the CD store. And I, I would always pick out records every, every, every week. And I remember I had a choice between the locks, which was like the group that was on bad boys label with puffy and, and mace. And I remember that was like the hot shit at the time. And my best friend at the time was like, yo, you get the locks album. And I was like, yo, I'm about to go get it right now. 
And, um, but also at the same time, this uh, single drop from Common with Lauren Hill um, and the one uh, Retrospect for Life. And it was, it was essentially, you know, uh, Common's, Common's uh, you know, song about manhood and abortion. And I was so drawn to that. At that at that age, I think because I recognized, you know, the sample was a Stevie Wonder sample. I heard it with my father, but there was something that like really stirred in me that was like, yo, go get that album. And I started listening to Common and then that just like kind of um, opened up the gateway for me to like expand on consciousness and, you know, African identity, you know, Afrocentrism through music. And I wasn't getting any of that in school. So hip hop was absolutely my first teacher in terms of um, in terms of something that I felt was really valuable in my life. So, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, let's get back to that. So I'm, I'm glad you defined what it is because I think, uh, you know, sometimes I feel like it, it's always good to define even the most basic terms. Um, mm. Like, for example, I think you and me, we'd be like, oh yeah, everyone knows Michael Jackson, right? Or Prince. But I actually met younger kids recently that have no idea who Michael Jackson is or Prince, right? So That's surprising. Yeah, so it's, it's mind boggling for me that um, I think sometimes it helps to kind of define, okay, what is it that we're talking about? You know what right. I mean? Because if someone's turning the radio now, they're like, this is hip hop. Like he, he got conscious through this. It wouldn't make sense. Right, right, right. 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 Yeah. yeah, I forget how old I am now. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think while I was reflecting on just coming to speak with you, I was like, yo, I got a lot of stories. I hope you ain't got time for me. <laughs> so Yeah, yeah, for sure. We, we got time. And if we can't get today, then we'll get uh, part two, part three, part four, whatever we need. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I was curious, you said um, your siblings are one is an auto mechanic engineer. Auto engineer. Auto engineer. And then you're the teacher. So like, um, how did you... Uh, decided to become a teacher of all things like mm. I know you shared about like your your um your dad being illiterate and so forth right was it seeing like okay I want I want to do for myself what my dad didn't have or what, what was it the motivation or the drive you know no I was like I was like trying to stun on teachers I really thought I could do their job better than them and you know I, I remember just being in the classroom and feeling like yo this is hella boring like this cat is is just here kept getting a check and he's not he's not even I know that there are things out there that are important to learn, but this cat is not is not offering that right now. He's not, and, in. <laughs> and, and you know, and and uh, you know, there was a, a sense of um, it was just a, a, a trying to unearth a certain truth because I I knew it in my heart at a very young age, you know, um, that there was just there were lies. I knew it that there were lies, and 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 I think that's where I was like kind of, you know, I was fortunate to have. Um, two black women teachers when I was in elementary school. And um, so going back a little bit to me not graduating high school, what's also, you know, ironic or, you know, troubling <laughs> for sure about this is that, um, you know, at a very young age, I was, I was you know, diagnosed as gifted. And um, I'm, I'm kind of glad they, do, they did away with those kind of distinctions for, for young, young kids now. But at the time I, I was, you know, I was diagnosed as gifted at second, in second grade. And um, throughout my whole experience um, throughout elementary school, um, I, I never had a, a moment where I wasn't being celebrated as a, as a scholar at a, at, a, at a young age. I was considered a prodigy. And I don't even know what they were measuring, honestly, but, um, you know, for my, my brothers and I, they, they, they thought that all of us were just like incredibly gifted. And I used to be told constantly that I would be the first black president. So can you imagine like having that context, like people believing in you to that degree at a very young age, but then you go to high school or actually middle school and it's a completely different situation because of demographics. So, um, you know, when I was going through school, um, you know, as a as a young kid, my, my family moved around quite a bit. I was born in L.A., but um, eventually my parents, because um, of economic pressures, essentially, we kept moving further and further east. So eventually I ended up in Riverside. That's where I went to high school. And so just even in terms of the demographic shift, um, going to schools that were a lot more diverse um, and then going to schools that um, where essentially my high school was uh, white and Latino. And me as a black and Asian kid, it was like, yo, how do you fit in? And I, I really struggled with finding a place in school. Um, you you know. know, like uh, when, when I first moved to America or yeah, in the early 90s, and I, I was going to Virginia at the time or for elementary school, 
I was one of two Asian kids in the whole school. Yeah. And then like I, I've never seen anything like it because I, I I grew up in, or I was born in Vietnam, right? So I, I'm used to seeing people like, look like me. And then uh, I was one of two Asian kids. And I was like, well, what is this? <laughs> Yo, it's it, and it's for for a young person trying to make sense of the world. You know, when when race is such a big part of the world that we live in, especially in America. Um, you know, you're just trying to you're just trying to find your place. You're trying to find your identity. You're trying to figure out what makes sense and. If you don't fit in, um, you know, some places can make that really hard on you. And so that was my experience going through, um, you know, kind of middle school and high school. I, I felt very like ostracized. I felt really alone. Um, I was bullied like in, intensely. I was bullied a lot um, growing up. I was also younger. Um, so like I was just smaller than most kids. But were you bullied because <coughs> of your uh, skin color or ethnicity? Or was there like a commonality between the bullying? Or just really I think it was, kids? it was everything. Okay. I think it's like you know, me being, you know, Afro-Asian and not really, but I've also Afro-Asian and dark-skinned. Um, and what does that mean? And then um, being a kid that was really into art and Ninja Turtles and for that to not be cool to some kids, you know, like, um, or maybe to not be as interested in sports at that time. And, you know, kids just were mean, you know, <laughs> like, it, unfortunately, you know, and, and I see this all the time, but, um, you know, I, I definitely had a really challenging experience through school. And so, you know, part of my motivation to go to become a teacher was really just to be the teacher that I felt like I needed in my life. Someone that was going to be patient and understanding. And, you know, I, the students I work with now, like, I, I, I can't wait to, you know, share a bit about that. But um, there's so much diversity in the students I work with because I teach special ed at the moment. And, um, you know, at the root of it is like, you just have to have a lot of empathy for people because everybody's coming with something. Everybody doesn't matter what they're, where they're at, you know, socioeconomically, what their race is, what their ability is. Everybody's, especially now, everybody's going through it. Yeah. You know, you know you're, you're the second person that has brought up um, the importance of empathy in the context of having in in yourself or in others, or especially the young, younger generation. Recently, I, I was watching this um, YouTube video by one of the world's leading experts on mental health. Her name is mm. Dr. Romani. So uh, it was like a masterclass on narcissism, right? Mm. But in any case, her husband is also a world leading expert in mental health. And then her husband and her, so two separate experts, you know, like both PhDs and so forth. So they're pretty uh, achieved, you know? Uh, but she said that if there's one thing that her husband and her agree on to pass on to their um, children, that over having um, a, a high paying job, a college degree, over having intelligence, is they both agree on their children need to have empathy. Yeah. Yeah. It's the, you know, it's, it's, it's that, that supreme social intelligence, you know, and it'll take you so much further. You know, it just makes life you know, this, the sense of understanding of one another. Like, yeah. I think that's, that's what we really need. Um, yeah. and so that's, that's part of what, how I teach, what I teach about. Um, and I, I bring that to the table every single day and I try to, you know, I'm, I'm doing the work alongside my students, um, which is what I love about teaching. Honestly, it's like, yeah, constantly. this is something you mentioned earlier that, uh, I, I was kind of curious about, cause on one end you, you mentioned that there was a lot of pushback on like what type of children or whether they have a hard life before your parents had you, right? And then you mentioned that um, you got you get a lot of, you had a lot of support um, as as a child growing up, right? Was that from the same? Was, it, was that within your family? And did they ch had uh, they change their minds or like, like how how did it go from like a reservation to like a celebration? Like you, you know. So how did it go from me being celebrated as a young student? Yeah, and because then, because before you were born, they had like um, reservations. Oh, oh. Uh, you know, like basically they were concerned about the the mixture, you know. Yeah, yeah. And then, well, it sounds like your childhood was very celebrated. And it was very supportive. Did, did it? Did, was that a change of heart or? Well, what yeah. I feel like my grandparents. They definitely ev their like perspectives evolved. You know, my I, I would say my grandparents. My grandfather for sure like was racist. He was, you know, a, a white man from Minnesota. He grew up in the Midwest, came to LA. You know, he didn't, he never really probably had relationships with black folks. He's adopting a Chinese, Chinese girl. Um, and I remember some of the ways that he would treat me as a kid. I felt like he would like go in on me because I was black. Like the things he would say to me, I just, like I could feel it as a kid. Um, you know, but ultimately they started to evolve. They started to accept us. And I think that's, that's part of life, hopefully, you know, like, even if you do feel like you have a certain perspective on people, that that shit can change, you know, and that's what life is about. It's about growth. And so I, I'm, I'm grateful to say that I did see my my grandparents grow. And, um, 
I absolutely loved my, my, my grandma for sure. She was a very caring and kind woman. And, um, you know, she, she was there for me. So, you know, and I have to like appreciate her because she took care of my mom, which obviously enabled me to be, to be here today. So I have love for her. Um, but it's interesting for, you know, my mom to be Chinese, but grow up in a white household. She, she came here when she was six. So a lot of my identity challenges have been around that as well. You know, um, you know, being Afro Asian and indigenous, but, um, you know, identifying largely as black, you know, the way that I move through the world, people see me as black. And, um, you know, I, I was also reflecting on, you know, my first memory, my first core memory was, I was probably four years old and it was a race. And, um, you know, it, it's a, you know, another quite painful experience, but, um, speaking about my brothers, um, so, my my brothers they were both like childhood models they did um print ads for like you know macy's and mervyn's and and those kind of things and uh i remember uh we were on set for mcdonald's <laughs> and uh <clears throat> sorry it always kind of chokes me up um we were on set for mcdonald's and uh my brothers are playing with Ronald McDonald and the, and the little purple dude. And I'm a kid and I'm like, yo, can I go play with them? And you know, they had to tell me like, nah, they're filming a commercial and you're not in the commercial cause you're too dark. So that was like what painted my experience in the world at a very young age. Like something's wrong with me cause the color of my skin. So, you know, I was getting it from my grandparents. I was getting it from society at a very young age. And then, uh, you know, especially when I got to middle school, that's where I felt it the most because I was, you know. Um, was it in the interactions with your peers, meaning other students, or was it the teachers or just everybody? Everybody, everybody, okay. everybody. Because, uh, you know, how important is it for you to go to school and see people that look like you, but especially teachers, right? And then to be able to look at your curriculum and you see yourself represented in it as valid, you know, I don't see, you know, obviously I don't see, I'm not going to see Afro Asian people represented in the curriculum, but I don't see black or Asian. And so I start to develop my own theories, feelings about, of it being inferior within that as well. Also, my family was incredibly poor. So, you know, and I was in the, the gifted classes with students that, we know now, like these intelligence tests, they don't actually measure intelligence. They often measure opportunity and wealth and, you know, affluence. And so, of course, I'm in the advanced classes with wealthy white students and I'm just shrinking, feeling more and more inferior every day in that did, space. Did you ever uh, feel like you made it in because you were, or you got elevated because you were in these gifted programs? Or did that, did that kind of change your, change others' perception of you? It changed my perception of teachers because I'd be like, you can't tell me shit because I'm actually smarter than you. <laughs> In, inside, I was like, nah, you're not it. Like, so, so like uh, that, that, um, that brings up like what you said earlier, and I think the two tied together, is you mentioned that you recognize some certain lies within the within your curriculum or within what the teachers were, te were teaching you. Was that like in history class or English or what? what, 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 what gave you that like, okay, this is BS? I mean, well, fortunately, I had two teachers that were black when I was in elementary school, Mrs. Scott and Mrs. Starks. And those women absolutely loved me. They 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 rode for me and they they were the ones that blessed their hearts. They like, you know, even if I was being a bad kid in fifth grade, sixth grade, like they always kind of reminded me of the expectation that they had for me. Um, and that was so key for me to kind of just have someone that believed in me. And even as I'm navigating through middle school and high school and I don't have those teachers, like I can look back and think like, yeah, those, those teachers have my back. And uh, yeah, I mean, I remember the first time that I, you know, I, I actually, um, freshman and, and, and uh, sophomore years, I damn near failed all my classes. I had a 0.6 GPA at one point. <laughs> and I was, I don't know what I was doing. I was, in some ways, I think I was just rebelling. I was just saying, yeah, fuck this. I'm not going to participate. Um, and, you know, I didn't see any value in it. The first book that I read in uh, in ninth grade was Great Expectations. And, you know, I, I'm like, 
I'm sure there's something there, but it doesn't speak to me. And I'm being graded on this. Like, come on. That doesn't measure my ability to like think about this critically or, um, you know, whatever, however I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, um, experiencing it. Like it's not a reflection of my intelligence. It's just, this, this is whack. And, you know, I, I think as a teacher, I think about that experience all the time. And, you know, like, you know, as a teacher, I, I definitely feel like I practice culturally relevant, culturally sustaining pedagogy because of those experiences of just like, yo, like students want to see themselves in the curriculum. They want to love what they're learning about. They want to, they want to, they want to find value in what they're learning about. And I didn't have those experiences. The first time I did was, um, reading the good earth by Pearl S. Buck, which is interesting because Pearl S. Buck is a white author writing about Wang Lung, who's a Chinese farmer, but it was like, yo, we're reading about Chinese people now. Now I'll pay attention. And then that's where I was able to like, and I, you know, like when it came to like, you know, all the things that teachers will measure you by, like, can you read and write and, and answer these comprehension questions? Those were never hard for me, but it was just like me putting myself into the education, the way that I think, the way that I think education is intended to be. It is, it is absolutely intended to be like an art. It's supposed to be a journey of our own, you know, search for knowledge. Schools don't provide that. So, yeah. Well, uh, so that makes me curious. Like, uh, why, why teach high school students? Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, meaning like versus middle school or, or college or any other grade. Was was there like um, uh, other reason behind picking high school students to teach? Well, yeah, because like I didn't graduate from high school initially, and I didn't actually feel like I started learning things and gaining an education until when I started as a hip hop. But then I went to college. I went to community college and. Um, and I realized that there's a lot of people in the world that will never make it to college and they absolutely deserve an education. So we have to start there, you know, and I've actually taught every grade. I've taught kindergarten through, through, um, through college, some college classes as well. Um, and I think, I mean, I, I do, I do, I love all levels, but, um, high school is like where they're, you're not dealing with as much of the developmental ma maturity issues high school kids, I can like really level with them for the most part, especially when they get to like 10th, 11th grade, they're like a little bit more mature. They're able to like unpack. They actually have, have some, you know, some, some context for the world. Um, and so, you know, not, not to say that middle schoolers and, and elementary school students don't have that as well, but you know, we're able to be, go a little deeper and be a little bit more intellectual about, um, about what we're learning about. And they can see the end of the finish line, right? They can see that, Oh, hey, I'm going to be out of high school and a year or two and I'm moving on to college. And I know that the things that Mr. Carter is talking about, those things are, are waiting for me. So let me listen up. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I just, I like it all, but, um, you know, I, I, I teach a lot of classes, um, right now I teach five classes. Um, I teach, um, PE, <laughs> I teach three English classes and I teach a film lit class. So, you know, I'm, I'm able to just kind of be myself with high school students too. What, how did you uh, make it into college? And also, why did you decide to go to college if you dropped out of high school? Like, was there like a... Uh, oh, yeah. A, yeah, what happened there, you know? <laughs> well, damn. I mean, I did want to tell this story, um, you know, because I thought, I think this is also important to understand, to understand, you know, my whole context for why I became a teacher. So as I mentioned, I went to high school in Riverside. And uh, there's, you know... I, this is a story I haven't shared with anybody, but, um, you know, Taisha Miller went to my high school and I, I don't know if you're familiar with that name, but Taisha Miller was murdered by the Riverside police department. She was, uh, in her car sleeping and, um, she was experiencing a coma. Um, and her car was locked with the, with the engine on and her friend that was with her called, uh, 911 to call the ambulance to get her friend. And instead the police showed up and they said that there was a gun. Um, but ultimately they shot a woman. They shot at a woman 23 times, shot her 12 times. And this was in 1998 um, when I was graduating from high school. And the, <clears throat> 
The troubling thing about that for me personally is that Taisha Miller was someone that I, I played basketball with. Um, she actually asked me to go to prom with her. And I was a junior in high school. I, I wasn't thinking about going to prom, but kind of the last picture that, um, that you know, when you look up her name, the last picture you see of her is a, a prom picture. And, you know, so that is, that is kind of felt like a, a sense of guilt for me that I didn't, like I, I wasn't, I, th I thought that and somehow I could have changed her life and this wouldn't have happened. Um, but that was my context for, for becoming a young adult was that like the police will murder you. And sure enough, as soon as I got my driver's license, um, you know, I, I was always, um, I felt like I never really got in a lot of trouble because even though I would, I would defy and I like hated school, like you could tell I wasn't a, a, a menacing kid. Um, was, you know, was there a part of you that just felt like the, the system wasn't built for you? And so why bother participating in it? In terms of teaching or in terms of my schooling? Yes. But when I became, when I became a young adult and I was like, I think I was 17, 18 years old at the time, I just got my driver's license. This is where I'm out in the world. And, um, I remember driving home one night and uh, getting pulled over by the the police with my friend. We were both driving two cars. And, and this was in Riverside again? This is in Riverside. And I remember this sense of just like absolute paralysis that came over my body because I'd never been, had the lights shine on me at night. And I was, was like- Was that after um, what happened to her? Yeah, okay. it was after, after what happened to Aisha. And, you know, like my father had the talk with me about, you know, as as all black parents do, they have the talk with their kids about what it means to be a black man in the world. And you go out and you got to be you got to be worried about the police. They're not they're not there to protect you, even though that's what it says on the side of their cart. Serve and protect is not what they do um, to me, to, to people that look like me. So my other me and my other black friend were driving home one night and, um, you know, uh, cop gets behind us and is following us for about about a mile and it's you know in my i'm like this seems excessive like why are you following us so as i'm driving i'm getting more and more nervous and i end up um seeing a green turn signal and i i end up running a red light because the the left signal was green and and i was in the the lane to go straight i end up running the light and sure enough the police officer pulls me over and i'm like oh my god i'm dead right i'm, I'm this is it like i broke the law all these things happen and uh, he, you know, he comes to my car, you know, I'm scared, I'm so scared. And uh, he runs my numbers, whatever. And, and, I, and he's like, you know what you did back there? You, you ran, the, ran the red light and I was like, yo, honestly, I was, I was scared. I told him that. And then the look on his face was like, damn, you know, like, I don't think he was expecting me to say that to him. Like, yo, I was scared. So he, he lets me go, he actually lets me go. And uh, I remember, thinking like, damn, actually cops are pretty nice. Like that cop let me go. He understood, like he understood how I wasn't trying to break the law or run the light. And he, he was practicing empathy perhaps. And- Do you, uh, you think by you just being honest with your feelings, it was like a, a, like a check, like, oh, like, you know, like he's scared and that's that's a real thing, you know? Yeah, I think after what happened to Aisha, like he probably had to, to reckon with that because that changed, that was a huge, that was a huge case. Um, it actually changed a lot. Um, you know, this is before Trayvon Miller, or, you know, or Trayvon, uh, Trayvon, uh, you know, and this was, this is 1998. So, um, you know, it changed a lot in terms of the practices of the uh, Riverside Police Department. So they, they were aware, like, this is a, this is a big deal. Like you guys are disproportionately pulling over young black people. So, you know, I'm thinking like, oh, this is, uh, this is not a, not, I mean, cops are chill. Like I can go about my life. Thank God I can go home. Literally two miles later, I'm still in Riverside. Another cop car comes and I'm like, this time I didn't run any lights. And, uh, and I'm like, this is peculiar. Like, well, the last cop let me go. Like, I'm sure this one will let me go as well. And uh, so I pull over and then I notice there's more than one cop car. There's like five cop cars and a helicopter. And I'm like, this is different. And, you know, I remember, yeah, just the fear of like being surrounded, you know, 
guns pulled from every direction. And yeah, that feeling that, yeah, your life doesn't matter. And, uh, you know, they, they pull me out of the car. <clears throat> And they accuse me of murder. <laughs> you know, and uh, yeah, I remember them telling me that, <clears throat> sorry, that uh, my car matched the description. And uh, the, the other funny thing about that was that, you know, I was, I was Asian kid and I was into racing. <laughs> So my car looked like um, it was a hot mess, to be honest. It was a, you know, I had gotten in an accident. So, you know, I was a young kid driving. <laughs> and I was like, it's cool. I'll, I'll put a, a racing bumper on. So I had a, like one of the body kits. And I Did had you a, have a rice bucket? Or? Yeah, yeah, I had a total rice bucket. I had a CRX. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and tr truth be told, my car was red, black, yellow, and gray at the time. It looked like a clown car. A big old scrape on the side. And uh, the police were like, oh, your car matches a description. And I just remember so so poignantly at that moment being like, bro, it's not my car that matches the description. It's my skin that matches your description. And that's what gave me, I mean, I'm 18 years old. I'm just getting out of high school. I don't know what the hell I'm going to do with my life. And uh, that gave me the kind of motivation to recognize that I have to do something. You know, I have to do something. And conversely, at that time, I was also working a warehouse job. I didn't have, you know, I didn't have anything. I was barely got out of high school. I, I ended up graduating from high school late, so I just took a, a warehouse job. And I remember working in the back of this truck for a Walmart. And I'm 19 years old or 18 years old. And the guy that's working right next to me is 40 years old. And he's making the same exact money as I'm making. And I'm like looking at him and I'm like, yo, I can't be you when I get 40. So here I am, 40, 41, and, and thank God I, I made something of my experience because, yeah, it was, uh, but it was definitely that experience with the police that was just like, yo, this world is, is kind of fucked up. And, uh, you know, I could have been Taisha at that moment and I wouldn't even be here to tell the story. So here I am. I, I felt like, yeah, I, I don't know what it was about education. I'm sure that, you know, well, well, we can get there, but you know, there, there was a lot of things that happened in between there as well. But, um, but yeah, I, I really believe in education as being as being a route to so many things, um, especially in terms of healing ourselves as people. Okay, wow, that was that was a lot to uh, unpack. How did you like manage um, in the days, months, or maybe even years after that experience? Like, did did it? Uh, was it something that was like kind of carrying on, you carry on your shoulder and, and kind of influenced how you view even like walking down the street or driving? Um, like, because you obviously made a set of actions that you overcame anything that might have held you back, right? So, like, how, how did you get there? Because that, that sounds very traumatic. I, I wouldn't even know how to process that, right? So, but, but you, you made certain steps to move forward. So, I think that's, that's really important to know. I'm smiling so much right now because. The next part of my story is I moved to Hawaii. I moved to Hawaii and uh, <clears throat> that was a choice that I felt like took so much courage because I had only lived in California to that point in my life. And, uh, you know, and I, I, I was working as a manager of a clothing store. I left the warehouse. I, was, I stopped working at Walmart. I was going to college, um, second class at Riverside Community College. And I was working in fashion retail at the time. I was working at Express Men's Structure. And... Uh, I remember uh, we brought in this new manager named Dusty and she was from Hawaii and she just had a cool ass vibe and we worked together and she would tell me stories about Hawaii and I was, I was applying for school. I was actually trying to go to UCLA. That was my dream to go to UCLA. And she just kept talking about Hawaii and I was like, you know what? Hawaii sounds dope. I think I need to get out of here. So I applied, got in and I, I, I just moved. And um, I remember moving to Hawaii and that being such a blessing for me because um, you know, in Hawaii, the people 
the people look more like me, you know, and that was that was amazing for me to be able to find a place where there are more Hapa people, more mixed people. Um, but specifically, the police officers are also, you know, island boys, folks of color. And so I didn't feel that sense of. Um, yeah, I had I definitely had like PTSD. I, I, I felt a sense. I, I didn't feel like when police were behind me uh, in Hawaii, like I felt like I was good, like they weren't going to be malicious. They weren't going to pull guns on me. So I was able to take a vacation. So H Hawaii sounds like it um, was a new safe place that you could be in while you were processing it and unpacking all that happened to you, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, it sounds very necessary to be in that environment after what you went through. Yeah. No, Hawaii was, Hawaii has been a, a complete blessing and, and now my entire family lives there. So I moved there just for college and then I was there for a year and I was, I was thriving. I was literally thriving. I was in college. I was at University of Hawaii. I was killing it. I was teaching. I was in my first year that I was teaching sociology classes and I don't know why they trusted me, but they were like, yo, you should teach. And I was like, cool, I'm with it. So I was teaching sociology classes <clears throat> my first year there. And then, um, I told my brother, my younger brother, um, yo man, you should get out of Riverside, like come live with me in Hawaii. And, uh, he, he, he ended up going there and, uh, yeah, my brother's also killing it right now. I'm so grateful that we made that decision to, to migrate, you know, and it was a migration. I, I wasn't aware that it would be, um, <clears throat> kind of a haven for mixed, mixed folks to go to. Um, but you know, it's so much of the culture because of the plantation society, um, that I was able to really develop an identity in Hawaii. Although, you know, there was, that was challenging too. There's not a lot of black people in Hawaii still. Um, the majority of black people that are there are athletes or military. So that comes with its own set of stereotypes. But overall, I, I would say Hawaii has been, um, yeah, Hawaii is my home now. Like, like I said, my mother lives there and, uh, and you know, it's, it's a place of refuge for me. It's where I go and get the most connected. So that's why I'm, I'm fortunate to be out there a couple times a year as well. So how do you think life would have been or the person you would be today had you not moved to Hawaii? Like, uh. I can't even imagine it because, you know, Hawaii opened the world to me. Um, you know, I was taking classes with students from Japan and Germany and I was like, yo, like Hawaii is dope, but I actually want to go where you live. So I ended up moving abroad. Uh, I was living in Japan. I was living in China, Taiwan, South Korea, um, you know, and, and so it just it gave me the sense of confidence that. Um, one, I could do whatever the hell I want. Um, and secondly, yeah, the world is small and, and there's people everywhere. There's things to see. I mean, I, I absolutely love, 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 love traveling, um, because it gives you an opportunity to just stretch your brain, stretch your imagination, stretch your perceptions of the world. And, you know, unfortunately, like, you know, I think all humans, I wish that all humans had that privilege. Um, but I had that privilege, um, through my courage. Mostly I didn't have money. I just was like, I'm gonna make this happen. Did, did, did you move to these places <clears throat> without, uh, a contingency plan, meaning like without a job lined up or like, <laughs> how did you, how did you make it happen? You know? <laughs> well, I, I can definitely say that education has been my passport. Okay. So, 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 so for sure. like, for example, you, um, when you moved to China, you taught in China as well. Is, was that what happened? So I, I actually went to school in China. I went to Beijing Dashui or Beijing university. And then, um, I, I went to school in, in Kobe, Japan. Um, I taught in Taiwan and I taught in South Korea. Um, and then through that, I would travel throughout Asia, um, in the times I was there. So, um, but school was definitely my, my, um, my passport. And I loved, I, I, I never, I've actually, I hardly ever take vacation, but I travel. So like, I make sure I have an address when I get there. Cause I want to be able to like immerse myself in where I'm about to be. I don't want to just be, you know, six days, seven nights or whatever, however it goes. I, I want to be there. I want to be a part of the community. I want to learn. So I've, I've been, I've been lucky to be able to like travel through, through education. So, yeah, amazing. Uh, what was your experience like living in China? Um, yeah, China was China was dope. <laughs> I, I, so I I went to China when I was in graduate school. Um, I, I I should also share that that piece. But I was going to I was studying my first master's in education at San Francisco State, and um, I honestly felt like the program was pretty bootleg and uh me and a, a number of students we had one dope teacher jeff Duncan andrade shout out jeff like he's 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 the, he's the man but uh aside from that you know the, the program is bootleg which shouldn't be surprising because k-12 through schools are bootleg and why shouldn't the university programs also be you know 
you know, bankrupt in that in that sense. You know, um, you know speaking of a uh, bootleg, let me add my contribution to that <laughs> <laughs> to that evidence. Right, uh, I remember in San Diego for high school. I forgot what year. It's been such a long time, uh, or maybe it wasn't memorable for me. Who knows? Um, so yeah, my, I think my English teacher. What is his name? I forgot his name, but um, yeah, I think Mr. Hall or something like that. Wait, you know, by, by the way, isn't it, isn't it funny how years later we still call our teachers by Mr. or Mrs.? Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, anyways, my English teacher, he, you know, as, as you, you probably know well, well, so sometimes teachers get audited or re reviewed. I don't know how deep that goes, but that does happen, right? Yeah, and so um, my teacher made a point to for have us to rehearse the questions that we were going to ask him, mm. um, and then he'll answer back. And so during the day when the auditor was there, we played through our rehearsal. You know, um, I, I guess you can say that was uh, a first piece of choreography that I was a part of. <laughs> mm. <laughs> you know, uh, so we played, played through the rehearsal. We had some questions, and then he busted out a guitar and he sang us like Bob Marley. And then after the auditor gave a, went, went uh, left, he gave us donuts for our, our participation. Right. Word. Uh, that, that that story is very funny to me, but funny to because I can laugh about it now. But as far as value, I, I didn't get any, any value out of it. Yeah, you know? yeah. So uh, that would be one of my bootleg experiences. I'm like, okay, I just got I, 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 this guy just gave me donuts to <laughs> make him look good. <laughs> yeah, the, a lot of teachers be collecting the check, man. I, I, I see that. That's one of the controversies of the education program, education situation, um, is that itself. Um, that's another conversation, but, but yeah, ultimately, like, I don't know why I went to grad school for education, expecting them to have the answers because they didn't have the answers. Like the whole system is kind of broken. Um, so, you know, we were actually going to walk out of the program, um, me and my, my, you know, cohort. And, um, we kind of did, but I, I, I just was, took it upon myself. Like, well, I'm already in grad school. Like I might as well go study abroad in China. And that was a huge deal for me because as I, as I mentioned, like, my mom being adopted, <clears throat> you know, kind of going through my whole experience, not, you know, being Asian and, and trying to identify with being Asian. But, you know, you know, I would experience it from other Chinese or other Asians as well. Like, oh, you're not, you don't speak. Oh, you're not, you're not Asian or you don't look it. So there was this part of me that was just like soul searching. So I was like, yo, I'm gonna go to, I'm gonna go to China. So that was kind of the, the motivation. Um, but like I said, my mom's from Hong Kong, so I moved to Beijing, and those are very different places. And so it was kind of a rude awakening to to go live in communist China after uh, after being in Hawaii, essentially. And there was uh, there was a lot um, that I had that I learned in that experience. Um, but you know, honestly, what I did a lot of is I played a lot of basketball. And I mean, I I wish that I there's a t part of me that wishes that I would have been more studious and just been in my books. But to be honest, I had the time of my life. I was traveling, playing basketball. I was on like an amateur basketball team. And yeah, those guys were amazing. I, I was able to, you know, learn so much about just life in China through hanging out on a basketball team while I was there. So it was, it was awesome. So, so you, you were on a Chinese basketball team? Is that right? Like, a, like a, they, I mean, China, in China, basketball is huge. Oh, I, would, is I would say that there's probably more organized, well, there's definitely more organized leagues out there than, than the United States, just by sheer massive numbers. But yeah, basketball is a big deal. And this was- I did, I did not know that. Like, it, yeah. It's there, I mean, it's, it's wild. You go to the parks and there's like, there's like a hundred basketball courts. So every kid is playing. And at the time, Yao was in the NBA. So basketball is huge. Yao was in the NBA. T-Mac was big. Kobe was big. So as a black black dude that was hella into basketball, um, I was e I was easily able to assimilate into a culture out there. Like I was getting picked up by teams. I was able to, and I was I was probably like 26. So I was kind of still in my prime at that time as an athlete. Um, so yeah, it was fun. It was it was incredibly fun to play basketball in China and um, have those experiences playing the game that I love. Um, where I, you know, limited, you know, limited Chinese, um, but also being able to connect through a game like that is beautiful. So, how did you, uh, did you uh, learn how to speak Mandarin, or was, was you part of the, the, the people that you interact with that speak English, or how, how did you communicate? Because like, like Mandarin or Chinese seems like a very difficult language to learn. Oh, it was, it was hella hard. It was, it was too hard for me. I learned a little bit, um, and and you know, like I said, I could have been a lot more studious. But luckily, my teammates were pretty international. So I had students from Mongolia, like Kazakhstan, Russia, um, Israel. Like we were all on this like traveling team, so we all spoke English. And so you know, it was it was it was really convenient for me to be able to have that experience. Um, and I was only in Beijing for a year. I couldn't I couldn't take it. It was it was it was a hard life. It's it's incredibly cold. Um, you know 
it's just extremes. Like I felt like the weather, the, the pollution, all that kind of got to me, the food sometimes. So I came back to uh, the States and I went back to school and I kind of decompressed from that year, but it was, it was dope. It was dope. Yeah. Wow. Very interesting. Let's talk about uh, public education. What, what is it like being a public educator? Like what are your, some, some of your struggles or successes and how do you deal with <clears throat> the pain points? Yeah. What's the last piece? And how do you deal with the pain points? The pain points? Yeah. Oh. Uh, like, like whether it's a pain point of not ha not having enough resources oh. or maybe students that need more support or maybe uh, other faculty members that don't see eye to eye with you, you know? I mean, I think all of education is pretty challenging. Yeah. So I, I, I'm very <laughs> curious because I, uh, you know, on one end, we just kind of like shared our bootleg experiences stories. Yeah. And then on the other end, um, it's been like made more and more uh uh, uh, aware in the past few years that teachers don't have enough resources. So like, you know, you're, it, it, it seems like you're climbing up a mountain is what I'm saying. So like, yeah. how, how, how do you manage all that? Well, it's, it's not just the last few years. I think it's infinitely been an issue with resources, especially for the students that need oh, not, not the last few years that teachers <coughs> have had issues, but the issue has been brought up. Oh know? yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, I, I do think that, you know, those issues are affecting and, and it's, 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 it's even harder now post pandemic. It's way harder now that I'm reflecting on it. But um, where do I begin? I, I think the the main issue, as we know, um, with education is funding. So let's start there. You know, uh, I used to teach in Oakland Unified School District, um, and that's where I began my teaching career. And with two master's degrees, um, I was making fifty thousand dollars a year. And you know, that's 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 one of the main problems right now is just. They say there's a teacher shortage, but there's not a teacher shortage. There's a shortage of people, professionals with master's degrees that are willing to work for fifty thousand dollars a year right now. So, from the from just a, a teacher perspective, like not being able to attract the the greatest talent, that's really impacting education. Um, you know, technology is an issue, of course. You know, we're all dealing with it as adults, but absolutely, young folks are dealing with it. Um, you know, and you know, we deal with students kind of battling them on their phones um, more so this year than before, because I think, you know, students went through an entire school year where they were on technology. So now to tell them to not use technology is kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's not native to them now. It's like, wait, what? Like, I can't just take all my classes online and just stare at my phone. Um, there's those issues. I, I think, you know, one of the other main issues is just the curriculum itself. And I would say that's probably supersedes everything else. Um, because when you think about school, what is the purpose of a school? You know, and this is something we don't typically ask, but you know, we should ask what is the purpose of a school and what are we actually teaching? And you know, what is the, what are we, what are we trying to, what is the result here? And, you know, I do think that schools were developed in America, um, specifically for civil obedience, right. And to, to get to, you know, it's like citizenship training, teaching people how to follow rules, how to be obedient, how to, um, adhere to authority. Yeah. I, I haven't, um, gone down that rabbit hole, but I did come, come, come across of, uh, someone telling me in the previous conversations for a while, but something about like the way that these schools are, um, set up it was I think during the industrialization period where mm -hmm. it's made to create workers rather than like thinkers, you know? Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, just unpacking that is like, wait, there's, we can do this differently. We should do this differently. Um, but that's the model that's been in existence for over a hundred years. And you also can add racism into that equation. And how does that affect people's schooling experiences? Um, you know, and you know, institutional discrimination, these types of things, how does that affect schooling experiences? So, okay. So you brought up like the, the funding piece, the, uh, the student piece and then the, uh, systemic piece, right? Mm. So let's start with the, the funding piece. <laughs> um, is that based on like where the school districts are? Are you, are you talking about like within that school, um, the funds aren't properly managed? Cause you know, I, I, I don't know it firsthand, but I do know that, um, uh, in one of the schools I went through, went previously went to for high school, um, like the school had no problem buying a new, a, a, a pretty ball and new piece of, of a football turf, you know? Where was this school? Uh, San Diego. So, so I, I now, now that I got me thinking, 
I, I don't know if that money was appropriately spent or the sports team just had more, more funding or I, I, don't, I don't know how, how that all works, right? But is, are you talking about like within the school system, uh, certain teachers or certain programs aren't getting enough money or that school itself isn't getting, getting enough money? Well, the disparity mostly happens district-wide mm -hmm. um, through recognizing that every district in California has a separate budget, you know, and the way that they get their money um, is different for every school. Um, and so this is something that I think more people should be aware of. But, um, you know, right now I teach in what's known as a basic aid school district. Is, is that the like official label for it or what does that mean? There's very little, there's 10% of school districts in California or less than 10% of school districts in California are basic aid. What basic aid means is that the funding for education comes from property tax. So if you live in an affluent school district, then those schools have more money for education and it's not determined by attendance. Most school districts, their funding is based on attendance. And so, and then there's, there's tons of other variables within there, other taxes and whatnot. But the main distinction that I'm noticing is the schools that have basic aid funding, which like I said, is property tax versus it being based on attendance. And I don't know who de determines which districts have basic aid and not, but it is creating a huge disparity between educational opportunity because of funding. Um, you know, as I just mentioned, uh, putting myself out there, like, you know, I was making sub $50,000 in Oakland. Um, I'm getting paid significantly more, essentially twice as much to teach in a different school district. Who teaches, who lives in that school district that I teach in though? I don't get to work with the black and brown youths of Oakland. I'm working with the students of Palo Alto. Luckily, I mean, not luckily, but you know, the circumstances of my position is I'm actually serving most of the students from East Palo Alto, um, who happen to also be largely black and brown youth. But this issue of educational inequality absolutely follows um, you know, systemic issues, specifically around property, right? Like the issue of redlining and property values and who had access to to home loans, you know. All of this is still playing a role in our educational system at this very moment. So, like, has this always been the case, or is, is this um, um, laws or regulations that got changed recently? Like, what what what, what time scale are we talking about here? I mean, I think this the you know the I'm not completely certain on how public schools, specifically in California, have been funded throughout history, but I do think that there has been some relationship to, I, I used to, the, the idea used to be that it was, it was, it was property values, right? But now it's, it's attendance or it's property values. But like I said, what's happening right now that I see is like 10% of the schools in California have basic aid and then the other 90% have a mixture of different funding sources. So by, by attendance, does that mean um, the total quantity of students attending the school or is like, let's say your class is 30 students, right? Um, as far as like who, who sign up and then 30 students sorry, show up year round. Is it based on like how how much you meet the actual full capacity or how many total students go there? It's based on, it is based on actual enrollment. Okay. Uh, not just actual enrollment, but actual attendance. So the okay. schools, the students have to attend school for the school to get the money. Yeah. And you know, that ends up having, that ends up changing if your school has less enroll or less attendance, then your school will get less money. So that also becomes an issue when students are not going to school. Um, and, and do you find that there's a different uh, proportion of students, I guess, sk skipping class depending on what neighborhood you're in or what school, what school district you're in? I mean, I think there's more, students are invested in education differently. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the fact is that the schools, I mean, I used to teach in East Oakland and those schools are not serving those communities appropriately. So there isn't the, the level of buy-in from students and, and I would understand that. Um, but, it, it, but the school district I teach in now is the considered the, the highest ranked school district in the country. So those students are incredibly invested in their education because it's serving them. Yeah, uh, you know, like like um, hearing how much potential uh, teachers make in Oakland, uh, considering how much how, how expensive Oakland is now, I, I don't know how anyone can can live there based on that salary. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, we, we're not even talking about SF. Right? Oakland is getting pretty pretty damn pricey. You know, this is the one that boggles me um, to no end because I would I live in Oakland. I would love to teach in Oakland. I would love to. So <laughs> this is the other. You asked me what was challenging about my job right now. The most challenging thing about my job right now is I commute two hours each way 
So I'm commuting four hours a day just to go to a school district that can pay me a professional wage. And I could live in the neighborhood that I teach in, but there's a number of reasons why I won't do that. For one, I, I'm a black and Chinese male. I, 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 I exist in this world, in this body. I want to live in a place that feels like home to me. I can't, I, in Palo Alto, Mountain View, those places don't feel like home to me. So I can work there, but I can't, it's hard for me to live there right now. Um, so that's why I live in Oakland. But also I, I loved when I was teaching in Oakland, I loved the students that I was working with. I loved the diversity. I loved the ideas. Um, you know, I love Oakland because Oakland is the home of the Black Panthers. Like I walk around and I see murals. I see the history around me every day. I want to live in that. Um, but unfortunately I, I can't, work in Oakland Unified and get paid what I need to get paid to, to be able to sustain myself here. Um, it's, it's tragic to be quite honest. And, and I do believe that, you know, it's an issue because the students in Oakland probably need me more than the students in Palo Alto, you know, and I, and in many ways I need them in, in that way too. I mean, I, I don't want to discredit the work that I'm doing. Um, I'm incredibly grateful. And, and I, I do think that, you know, regardless of, of, the demographic or where my students are from. Like I, I love my students. It doesn't matter where they're from. And, and it has been interesting for me. This is the first time I've had, um, students that are, that come from these affluent backgrounds. And, you know, that's a shift for me to, you know, to, you know, to think about the kind of needs that they have versus the kind of needs that needs that my students had in previous years. So that's been really interesting for me as well. Do you find that the conversation you have with your students or what they find interest in or choose to talk about, um, varies based on their background or I guess social economic status for sure. But I think there's definitely some commonalities just on age. Yeah. Um, and you know what I love about, I, I, you know, I, I don't want to focus too much on the issues in education. Cause I, I actually, I fucking love my job and I want to just put that out there. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful to be able to say that I fucking love my job. And, um, because I'm able to, you know, I'm able to work with students in a way where, um, we're just exploring the world. And, you know, I have to be mindful about um, what it is to work in um, a community that is more affluent, probably more conservative, probably more Republican than me, um, to be to be straight up. But I don't see them like that. I see them just as kids. And the way that I, I feel like I commit, connect to them um, is quite different than probably how I would approach education in other contexts. But one of the things that I've been really unpacking this year is epistemology, just like the study of knowledge. Like, why do we know the things that we know? And if I can use that to enter, you know, the classroom, that that sort of curiosity, every kid can get on board with that. And the things that we talk about, there are common themes. Um, and I do, I don't censor myself in the classroom. I, 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 I know that they'll probably never have another teacher quite like me. Um, who happens to be uh, and has has a background in ethnic studies, but also is a DJ. My students, I'm a DJ, and like, <laughs> so we do connect over music. Um, and you know, so I, and I, I honestly like a, a huge part of my my curriculum is music. So um, I'm able to connect to kids no yeah. matter where they're from. Yeah. So on on the, um, I guess to close out the topic of struggles in education, how how can these schools be supported? Like, uh, what can either like parents or just any residential um, person in, in those, these, these neighborhoods do, or even people not, not from that those neighborhoods. Like, like how can schools be supported? Is it uh, through voting for a certain legis legislation, legislation or I, yeah, just, I have no idea how to, how to support schools, you know? Well, I mean, what, what's coming to mind for me is I, I don't have a lot of um, faith in the legislation and the politics, to be quite honest, because it's been this system, the, 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 the statistics of achievement have been the same for 50 years. So I don't expect it to change in one year, but I do. What, what comes to mind is the same thing, you know, just the ancient, <laughs> the ancient traditions of it takes a village, right? We're, we're not, we're, we're putting too much on the schools and it's like, no education. Everybody should be educators. Family members should be educators. Brothers and sisters should be educators. Neighbors should be educators. And that in itself is what builds community. And that's what we're focusing on. You know, I, I, one of the things I tell my students all the time, because they'll, they'll tell me all the time they hate school. And I'm like, yeah, school's whack. <laughs> you know, like I hated school too. But don't ever tell me that you hate education. And I try to make that distinction super clear. Um, and education happens everywhere. It doesn't happen just in the school. So the more that we, as a community, as citizens, we continue to grow in our education, that's going to help students. If, they, if, they, if your kids can see that, yo, when Pops goes home, he reads a book instead of, 
whatever is on his phone. <laughs> like, you know, these are the things that it's like, we just have to model what we want to see in the world. And it's not just teachers. It's all of us that needs to, to be participating in that. Yeah. There's a quote that I, uh, I really like it's from uh, Archie Burnett. He says, uh, life is class, pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> Facts. <laughs> life is class. Life is class. There's always a test. There's always a test. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let's talk about like the uh, curriculum uh, yeah. in, in education. Like how, how, how is that decided? And because uh, there are a few things I'm, I'm curious about and we'll get to it one by one, such as, you know, um, I think banned books is a hot topic recently. Mm. And uh, I don't know anything that goes on into that, but I am curious about some of the choice of the banned books, right? And so, like, how how does all this stuff get decided, and how do you personally feel about like um, this happening? Well, if a, ba a book is banned, then I'm going to want to read it. Yeah, I, I mean, straight up. So I don't even that doesn't even cross my mind. I mean, I think there's topics that I'm not going to talk about in class sometimes, mm -hmm. but it's not. You know, if a book is banned, I mean, facts, I'm, 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 I'm black. Like it was illegal for us to be able to read in this country. So anything I'm not supposed to read, I'm, I'm want to, I want to read that. And I think my students are the same. I think students are the same. They like, they want the thing that they can't have. So, you know, I haven't dealt with that issue. In fact, like, 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 for example, some of the books, um, that made it to the, the ban list is like really surprising to me, uh, but they, they don't even seem controversial. So I think it was like Charlotte's web and the giver and all these other stuff. And I'm like, that's banned. Like, I don't get it. I don't know who's banning these books and I yeah. don't know where these books are being banned, but that's never been an issue for me. Thankfully. Um, I've been, I've been really fortunate, um, that I've worked in schools that see me as this kind of, uh, how would I describe myself in, in the classroom? I wear a lot of hats. You know, like I said, I, I teach PE. I've, I've taught, you know, critical media studies. I've taught sociology, I've taught ethnic studies. I've taught English. I've taught history. Um, I've taught meditation. I've, I've, I, I do feel that when, uh, when, when you come into my classroom, it's like, you're just going to Mr. Carter's class. They call me Mr. Carter. They call me a lot of things, but this year they call me Mr. Carter. Um, <laughs> you're going to enter Mr. Carter's mind <laughs> and whatever's in there, like you're going to, you're going to kind of be exposed to. And so, um, you know, I, I, am constantly freestyling and audibling. I don't follow any kind of curriculum because my, my approach to education is very student centered. Um, and so I'm learning about my students and I'm creating the curriculum based on where they're at and what they know and what they're interested in. And I'm doing that every single day. I, I definitely want to applaud you for doing that um, or taking that approach because I think it takes way more effort to be <laughs> student centric and versus being um, curriculum centric, right? So, because I, I, it always reminds me of this video I saw on the internet, the interwebs, <laughs> a few years back, where uh, I think some some student was like really complaining to teachers, like we're tired of worksheets, we're tired of worksheets. Oh, what is this you give oh, us? We're tired okay. of worksheets, right? Yeah. yeah, and then it's like we, we just t teach us like like a human being, you know? Yeah, I mean you know, that, that banking model of education where it's like, I'm the professor, I'm the instructor, I have all the knowledge and I'm going to test you on how much of what you can recite to me. That ain't it. Um, yeah. I, so, so you mentioned, you mentioned like being able to freestyle. Is, is that something that like a lot of teachers are afforded or uh, how did you get, or how, how does someone get more flexibility in the curriculum? You know, cause obviously you have your background and then you have like the, the district that you're in, right? Like where, where does the two meet as far as curriculum, you know? So this time I will speak to the count, the camera, because anybody that's aspiring to be an educator, I would highly recommend being an English teacher because then you can teach literally anything. You can audible all the time. Um, you know, if I want to teach history, I can easily do that in English class. If I want to teach science, I can easily, easily do that in English class. If I want to teach what's happening on the news, I can easily do that in English class. That's it's language, it's communication. Um, and text itself is its own interpretation you know text is not just books text is film text is music text is poetry um text is social media so you can use all of that and justify it within the standards right the common core standards for education so i never really worry about um, my curriculum because i can always um tie it back to standards and you know and this is this i also have data to support this because um a couple years back, I was hired by LA Unified, a charter school in LA Unified, to pilot um, ethnic studies classes for middle school. 
The twist was that I was also actually teaching ELD, which is English language development classes, which is students that are, you know, varying, um, varying stages of, of English learners, um, mostly immigrant students. And instead of teaching them C spot run, I was teaching them ethnic studies and they, you know, I can do the same structures of teaching grammar and teaching academic vocabulary, but the content is completely different. And what they found was that um, this school was in danger of getting shut down. And they found that the year after I had been teaching there, test scores went up 50%. Amazing. Just from teaching ethnic studies. And and I don't think that's just, I think there's, there's the magic is ethnic studies because, you know, that's what I, what I was referring to in terms of culturally relevant pedagogy. It's like students want to learn about their cultures. Like my students were largely um, Central American. So mostly come from El Salvador, Guatemala. So we're learning about the Mayans, the Aztecs. And they're like, wait, we never learned about this before. And then we're able to tie that to things that are happening in the world. You know, at the time, you know, Trump was the president. We're dealing with all these immigration issues. Like them being able to, to learn about the things that not only they're experiencing in their own home lives, but also having that legitimized in the classroom is so powerful. Unfortunately, that's not the way the school system is set up. Um, th- most teachers don't have the freedom that I, I'm, I've been able to have, as well as the, the courage, to be quite honest. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I've taught about, uh, <clears throat> not a banned book, but a banned word. I've taught about the N-word explicitly in my classroom, and that was one of the most powerful things I've ever done. Um, at that same school I was teaching at, which I said was 99%, uh, you know, Central American, uh, Latinos from Central America, we were having a situation where students were using the N word all around campus. And as the only black person at the school, I was like, yo, this is not it. Like, let's, can we unpack this? And all the other teachers were like, yo, Mr. Carter, like, can you talk to them? And eventually I just built a whole curriculum around the word and, the students were able to apply what they were learning there because I wasn't just teaching about the N word. I was teaching about the legacies of slavery and where that word comes from. And, and, you know, when students learned about things like lynching, they were like, Oh, so we've been saying this word, but we had no idea that people were getting lynched over this word. And, and for some, some people that was the last word they heard before they died. Maybe I'm not going to be so cavalier about saying that word around my friends and teachers were like, yo, like, I'm seeing a change in my classroom. And it's like, if I didn't have the courage to have that conversation, that level of vulnerability, like, I don't think that, I, that just obviously wouldn't have happened. And, you know, there was there were schools that were like, yo, can you come to my school and teach that too? And it's it's something that happens a lot, you know? Wow, I, I did not expect to hear that. So now I'm curious, uh, what are some takeaways that I guess on a general or condensed manner that we can take from that work workshop? And what are your thoughts on like, should the N word be said by anybody or just <laughs> a, like a, a certain group or, you know, like just, I'm very curious, right? About that. Um, I mean, when the way that I, I approached it was like, I'm not, there's, there's 300 of you kids. There's one of me. I'm not going to be over here policing y'all about the N word, but can I give you some resources to think about it? And for you to be able to hold it in context and give it, give it, you know, you'd be able to formulate your opinion from that. So I, I, I not only gave the, you know, opinions from people like Kendrick Lamar, right, who they can obviously connect with. And Kendrick Lamar is like, nobody besides black people should say the N word. Then I gave them resources from Cardi B, who says, I'm a Latina from, from New York. I should be able to say, say this word. And they were able to draw their own conclusions. But what I loved seeing was that they were able to just, you know, some of them checked themselves. Some of them felt like, oh, no, I, I agree with Cardi B. And I, didn't, I wasn't mad at them. I was like, yo, as long as you think about it, because you weren't thinking about it before. I, I assume you weren't thinking about it before. Um, but my feeling about it is that, yeah, I mean, historically, like, you know, my father lived through that word, right? And he grew up in Mississippi where that word has so much power. And I think it still has a lot of power. And even though we've reappropriated it and it has become part of the common lexicon, I think understanding the word, saying the word without context is inherently problematic. And I cringe when non-blacks use the word because I honestly don't think it's appropriate. Um, you know, I, I, I do recognize that in you know, you grew up in community, it happens, you know, and, and I, I, don't, I don't like hate on people that use the word. You know, but I, I I can tell when somebody is using it in a way that just feels like amateur, 
like you haven't been around enough black people to even to even understand that word in context and you've never been a nigga like you've never been that and been called that and demeaned in that way so it's for us to reappropriate reappropriate it not for you to use it as something that makes you feel cool um if that's what i'm assuming that's why you use it but um yeah i mean it's 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 one of those things where i'm not out here trying to police it i'm just like can we have some consciousness around it yeah uh, great points and so uh, what are your thoughts on like its usage in music especially in the i guess the current generation of hip-hop you know uh, which i would assume that there's a lot of non-black people that's being exposed to it and you know maybe they feel the urge to say it i, I, I don't really know i'm just assuming right so, yeah so i i will always refer to tupac and it's our it's our you know understanding of the word right never ignorant getting goals accomplished right like that's a re you know a reappropriation of the term never ignorant getting goals accomplished and you know, like Tupac is someone that comes into my classroom a lot. Tupac, you know, Nipsey Hussle, these 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 heroes, and I will point to them, and and you know, they obviously use those words, but look at the entire context for which they, you know, they're they're practicing um, their their art, right? And so that's a, another part of it in terms of hip hop. It's like as an educator, part of my job or not even just as a teacher, but as a, as a participant in, in, in the culture, it is, it is my job to educate young folks on the, the, the growth and the birth and the, you know, the transformative potential of hip hop and to understand that what's on the radio isn't the entire, you know, spectrum of hip hop hip, you know, hip hop is, you know, I, I can legitimately say hip hop saved my life because of the stories I shared with you earlier. Um, and so I'm, for that reason, I'm, I'm incredibly protective of it. I'm very possessive of hip hop because hip hop was for us as disenfranchised, oppressed people, as a, as a form of communication, as an art form for us to overcome those oppressions. It wasn't meant to be selling, uh, you know, sneakers and, and Pepsi ads, like the way that corporations co-opted hip hop is absolutely heartbreaking to me. And so when people think about hip hop and, you know, what it is and what the image is, you know, it's, it's one aspect of it. And it's not the one that I feel like is the best representation of us as people, uh, unfortunately. And so, um, I hate that some of the hip hop that is out there gets so much airplay, um, to be honest. Agreed. Yeah. Um, one of my friends coined hip hop or like they refer to it as a uh, resist resistance music. Yeah. And I feel like that, that really bothers with me, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And, um, and as I mentioned, like that was where I got my education. That was way more valuable to me than anything that I was reading in books in school. And it continues to be, you know, um, you know, Chuck D calls it the black CNN. Like this is, this is where we learn about the world. This is where we had a platform was hip hop music. So I can't hate on, you know, stu I don't focus on the language that they might be using. I mean, to obviously the content, you know, I, I want it to be creative. I want it to be hopefully uplifting. I want it to be um, conscious and thought provoking. I want it to be educational, but I know that that's not all of hip hop. I know that hip hop is also entertainment and it's party music and um, you know it's 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 a it's someone sharing their perspective. But I do think that we we kind of um, we've just been bombarded with one sort of <laughs> variety for so long, and you know I, I I that that definitely leads to why I became a DJ, you know. In, yeah. On, on the other hand, <laughs> yeah, uh, so many points to unpack. Uh, one thing I want to ask you about, and uh, I think it's it makes sense within the context of like hip hop or uh, the stuff you teach in your classrooms, right? Or even just like racial issues, and that would be culture appropriation. Mm. So um, I, I feel like the term has gained a lot of like prominent use in uh, recent years. But I, I think there, there's, there's, a, there's a gray area where it's like being misused and probably possibly weaponized or maybe just like just used in place of actually understanding. So, uh, you know, uh, I'm sure you're, you're aware of like, there's the whole uh, phrase, you know, you're a guest in the culture, right? Mm. And, and yeah, and so I guess even taking hip hop <clears throat> or music out of it, there's things like, okay, let's, let's say cultural appropriation. Let's say um, someone in... America, let's say like an either African American or Asian American, right, uh, has certain views on like how that culture should, or meaning African or Asian culture should be represented, right? It, but like, um, I don't see a lot of um, 
uh, discussion happening with actually people from those countries. So, for example, even though I'm Vietnamese American, I moved here when I was six years old, and I'm, I'm pretty much like Vietnamese American, but not like Vietnamese Vietnamese, right? Mm. So I, I don't feel like even though I'm Vietnamese American as far as bloodline goes, I, I don't have enough skin in the game to like speak for Vietnam, for example, you know. Mm. But I see like a lot of like those uh, like people in America speaking for other countries, mm. while not including them in the conversation, right? Uh, not saying it's right or wrong, but just saying there's there's something to like unpack there as far as when is something actually culturally appropriated or when is it when is using that term in place of someone else's voice actually kind of um, silencing them, you know? You know, I can share specifically how it it kind of um, manifests in, in music and specifically how it manifests within house music. Um, and, you know, hip hop and house kind of birthed around the same time, right? And coming from similar, um, you know, similarly transformative, I, I would feel. Um, I... I, I House and techno. I have a a, a painting by Sh by Shivi. House and techno is black music, and I try to hold that, um, try to maintain that understanding for people because, you know, when we think about, I, I hear it all the time. It's like people will say, "Oh, this is house music, and it's not the house that I know. It's what they would consider EDM or whatnot." And then there's this constantly um, blurred line between what is EDM and what is house, and what I find is that, you know, there's there's been a lot of controversy in terms of like even looking at music festivals, who are the, you know, the the the, the headlining acts. You don't see a lot of black DJs um, in these in these, you know, in these spaces. And so one of the problems is that the people that are creating the culture are not getting recognition. You know, and it's also, and I would argue in some ways, taking away from what the root of the culture was. Um, and so I, you know, I definitely see that happening a lot within the DJ element. Um, and as far as appropriation in general, like, I think that, you know, it comes down to like a level of respect and understanding. Like if you're going to borrow from a culture without respecting and acknowledging and understanding the people that created that culture, that feels problematic. And you see that happening a lot in our generation. I think with dance, right? You see, um, you know, people that make their careers as dancers and, but they, you know, maybe they trained specifically in a studio and they learned through YouTube, but because of who they are and who, and, and, you know, the body that they represent, they're able to go further in the same, you know, in the same craft as the people that, than the people that created it. And that feels problematic. When I think of culture appropriation, I think of examples where someone takes on the identity of like, okay, uh, I really like this culture, therefore now I'm like that, right? You know, mm. whether I'm white, I'm black, or I'm Asian, you know? Uh, I guess in the other example I was thinking of, let's say if you're a non-Asian person in America wearing um, either an Ao Yai or Chipao, uh, right? Wearing a what? Uh, Ao Yai or Chipao. It's like the the uh, the garments in China or oh, Vietnam. Okay. Yeah, you know, like the, the dresses like the uh, women wear. Mm. Yeah. So let's say that you're a non Asian in America wearing one of these out garments, right? And then I, I see a lot of Asian Americans like, oh, yeah, you can't wear that. You're culture appropriating. Mm. Meanwhile, um, Chinese or Vietnamese in Vietnam or China, they're like, oh, yeah, we love it when when uh, other foreigners wear our stuff, right? So I feel in that context is kind of what I'm trying to get at. Like, I, I feel like um, there's some some blockage of culture being shared right, right there mm. just because there's fear of like it fear or labeling of it being culture appropriation. I, I would just hope that at the root of it is appreciation. Yeah. And the root of it is respect and not like an erasing of the people that created it, you know? Yeah. And I think that's part of the problem that I see. And you see that a lot, even, you know, I, I mean, I have some friends that are, um, you know, in cooking and you see that happening where, certain things are being appropriated people's dishes and they're not being attributed to the actual culture that that yeah there, there was a, 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 i guess speaking of food and vietnamese there was some group or family out there that tried to trademark the word pho oh and i was insane. like are you shitting me right yeah, now? yeah yeah so so i i definitely see where you're coming from i guess the, the area that i was trying to find out is like people who are generally connected to, to that culture right um but they're being labeled as cultural appropriation by people that don't, don't know them just just from like a surface level understanding, you know? Well, I mean, I think this is the world we live in, cancel yeah. culture, people labeling everybody. And, 
you just have to know if you're doing that work in your heart and only you can know that, you yeah. know, and the people that are around you, they should also recognize that. And that's all you can really do. You can't worry too much about what other people are thinking. If again, you're coming at it with the right intentions and it is rooted in respect, it is rooted in appreciation. Then Yeah. I, I, that's a good point. Um, you know, I think, I think you just made me realize that maybe, uh, what I'm wondering about or noticing is like the cancel culture movement kind of overtaking other other um other movements right and just kind of like overriding their voices i mean it's it's it i guess it's it's scary it's kind of terrifying you can't you can't be yourself you can't speak your mind without people being you know feeling like you're gonna um yeah be canceled or or be you know ostracized for your viewpoints and you know <sighs> I haven't really been thinking a lot about cancel culture because I've been just kind of checked out and literally in my own world, like I said, I'm, I'm commuting four hours a day. I'm in my classroom and I'm not, you know, this is probably me putting myself out there as much as I, as I have in a long time. Um, if ever, if not ever. And I, that kind of crossed my mind, of course, like, you know, if I go on a podcast and I say something that people don't agree with, how are they going to feel about me? Should I even go on the podcast? Should I talk? And, you know, I'm, I'm definitely trying to be rooted in, in my own courage of saying, hey, like, even if you don't agree with me, you can understand that I'm coming from a place that is like empathetic, that is um, hopefully like with the right intentions. And we can have a dialogue, we can have a conversation, we can we can learn from one another. Just like my grandparents, they evolved in their perspectives on race. We're all capable of that. And you know, I, the, the, I think one of the problems with our society right now is that we just identify so strongly with our identities. And a lot of them happen to be um, political. Um, and when we get so sort of fixated on what it means to be this and what it means to be that, that we're not able to think and recognize the commonalities, really. I mean, we're just so focused on divisions. And that's not going to get us where we want to be as a, as a species, ultimately. It's not going to get us where we want to be as a society, so, you know, just again, like having the courage to, to make sure that you're coming from a good place, but to be able to speak, uh, speak how you feel, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, with that said, I definitely appreciate you coming on the podcast and being, uh, be comfortable with all this. Cause I, I know it can be a lot. I, I run through <laughs> those thoughts, um, before every episode. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's real. It's, I mean, we live in some, some wild times and, you know, it, it does make you feel like man, I just kind of want to hover and cover myself up. And, yeah, I, I think all the time, canceled. like, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think all the time, like, does, does me saying this one thing uh, or have this topic going to get me canceled? I think about it all a lot, but you know what? I, I, can't, I can't control what other people may perceive, but yeah, I can't yeah. control um, to show up as, like, as genuine as I can, you know? Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so, great response. Uh, on the topic of curriculum, I also wanted to ask your thoughts on race, specifically um, critical race theory. Like, I, I, I tried looking it up, and uh, I'm not really clear on what it is or isn't, you know? I, I do want to acknowledge that part of my curiosity is from seeing so many news outlets speak negatively about it. Mm. And so that makes me wonder, is there an agenda happening, or what exactly is it? Because um, uh, I think it might be a new term. At least it was not a term when I went to school. Yeah. So uh, could you help me understand what exactly is it? And and I guess how how is it different from like teaching more full, comprehensive and accurate history? You know, Cause I, I really don't know what it is. Well, I mean, I, I think in the term critical race theory has been completely weaponized. And yeah, so that, that's, know, that's, that's where and, I'm, 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 I feel like it's, it's it got robbed, whatever it is, you know, it's I mean, it's it's very cringeworthy for me um, because when when, when you asked me about that previously, I was like, do I even know what critical race theory is? And, and I only say that because I've been teaching that way my entire career. And, you know, critical race theory, I mean, unpacking it further, it's based on the notion that there's no biological basis to race. However, race is real in our society because we make it real. And a lot of people don't want to reckon with that fact we in terms of race in america it's been a very the situation is always in whatever is convenient to the dominant you know system so you know earlier in the development of our our country like so much of the policies were based on the idea that there were separate races that blacks are not the same as whites therefore they deserve to be enslaved and native americans are also not the same and therefore we can have fulfill manifest destiny when it was convenient to the dominant culture race was real 
Now, fast forward, and people don't want to talk about race. Although it has absolutely defined every aspect of our society today. And it's like, you can't just talk about, you can't just decide that you, you don't want to talk about race when it's inconvenient to you or when it makes you feel uncomfortable. Like, so in my classroom, I've never thought about critical race theory because I've always wanted to teach a curriculum that spoke to the truth, that spoke to honoring the history of everyone that was involved. If that's controversial, then y'all should fire me because I don't know another way to teach. The way that I was taught, where it was like, let's learn about the Mayflower, the Nina, the Pita, let's learn about, you know, our forefathers and Thanksgiving, like that shit's out. Like I'm not teaching that. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, if that's controversial, then, you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> it, one of the things I, I do think about is, is, you know, and talking about being canceled, I, I, I absolutely feel like I'm kind of a secret agent. You know, I, I work for the system, but I, I don't work for the system. And, you know, I, I am, I'm constantly trying to dismantle these stories. Um, that's the work that I do. And so if that's controversial, then yeah, I'm sorry. But the system that you want me to teach has not been working for so many people. So I'm going to teach what I think is not even what I think, but what I'm going to not be afraid to explore what's out there. And that's why students, for lack of a better word, that's why students fuck with me because they realize like, you know, like teachers will always ask me like, why don't you have behavior issues? And I'm not to say that I never have behavior issues because kids are on their own journeys, like facts. But for the most part, I don't have a lot of behavior issues because when kids come to my classroom, they're like, that dude's not wasting our time. That dude is actually like sharing knowledge with us. Like, why would I bankrupt that right now? Um, and so, you know, my students, if they're my customers, my students, my customers are pretty satisfied. Um, so, you know, I, I, like I said, I, if, if it's controversial, if it's, if it's a problem, then I'll probably just leave teaching. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, okay. So let's backtrack a little bit. Like is critical race theory, a set of like predetermined curriculum or is it, uh, applied to certain topics? Um, or, or is this like a label that some external group created to weaponize it like i know. think i you know i i don't know exactly i think critical race theory like started as you know because i i studied sociology so we had critical conflict theory and this was based on the idea that you know society is based on exploitation you know and we can see that <laughs> for sure we can see the exploitation we can see the conflict that uh exists because of exploitation and things like capitalism and inequality um so i think that critical race theory is just an extension of that sociological theory i may be wrong so i don't think it was always weaponized but i think more recently it's been like crt this like why are they teaching us about slavery and it's like because this shit happened yo and like we need to deal with that yeah like you know and and and, and that's the thing like uh, you know there's so much knowledge out there. There's so much information. Like, why are we limiting ourselves to what's there? It's because we're uncomfortable. Like, you know, obviously it's there because it's there for us to learn from it. And, you know, one of the most, you know, like I was very fortunate to go to college and be able to study things like sociology and ethnic studies because I was like, yo, I'm finally getting an education. And, you know, if you were to really learn about slavery, in the ways that I've had the privilege of studying slavery, it will make you feel completely different about every aspect of the world that we live in. And the fact that humans could do that to another group of people, not thousands of years ago, but just a few generations ago, you know, and then to even move forward to things that were happening during World War II, it's like, you know, and during the Vietnam War, like we don't wanna talk about these things. Like these things were not that long ago. And we have this sense of like historical amnesia, like the less we talk about it, the better it makes things in our society. And it's like, nah, y'all like have some courage and actually confront the shit and deal with the inequalities because for so many people, it's an abstraction. Like, oh, I'll learn about slavery. I'll learn about injustice when I feel like it. But you don't have to go home and live in a disadvantaged neighborhood. You know, like I've lived in Los Angeles. I live in Oakland. You know, like my heart breaks all the time because I lived in, you know, before I moved to, before I moved to Oakland, I was living in downtown LA, you know, post pandemic, like downtown LA is like, 
it's like a war zone. It's like, you know, if you haven't been down there in a while, it's like literally walking dead down there. And you see such an issue with homelessness and mental illness, but you also see that the majority of those people are black and brown people, mostly black, honestly. And you recognize that this wouldn't happen. You know, I've, I've been fortunate to also travel. You won't have a skid row. You don't have a tenderloin in other places in the world. People actually will take care of their citizens. In America, we treat black people like they're the problem, you know? And so you, you know, and if we, we start to internalize that, we start to internalize that we're the problem. And that's why we don't always do well in school because we, we feel like we're not worth anything. Like this is what was taught to us through the institutions in this country. And so I absolutely go to school with, a, 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 you know, with the, you know, the intention of, of unpacking and unearthing that shit. So, so would it be fair and uh, um, accurate to say that just kind of facing the full reality of these situations, either in the past or present, right, um, is something that needs to be done. But there's a group that's labeling it a crit critical race theory and using it as like a a barrier to learning about these difficult topics. I mean, the people that want to maintain the status quo, yeah, the people that have benefited from these atrocities, the people that have benefited from these legacies of oppression. Why would you want to talk about it? Why would you want to acknowledge it? Why would you want to have a conversation about reparations? You know, why would you want to do that when your whole society is based on these inequalities? Why would you want to have that conversation? Um, and so this is why I, I, you know, I became a teacher because, you know, there's, there's a, there's a fight that is not, that is not optional for some people. And, you know, like I, I think when you asked me why I became a teacher, I do believe I could have become a lot of things. I, I wanted to study marine biology, <laughs> like straight up. So I went to Hawaii. I wanted to study marine biology. And to be honest, before I can save the whales, I got to save my people, you know, and I got to do what I can to save my people. And, um, you know, I, I, I think there's a lot of people that, that have that burden. Um, and unfortunately, like I said, like a lot of the work comes down to, you know, we have to do a lot of the work and it, and it shouldn't be that way. It should be all of society doing this work and not just the people that have been the most affected or the most oppressed by it. Yeah, I completely agree with that. So like, uh, well, that's, that's very insightful about the critical race theory. So it sounds like your, your experience in the classroom is completely diff different from how certain organizations in the media portrays it, right? Because I've, I've seen a lot of stuff like, oh, uh, critical race theory is brainwashing our students and all these parents are pushing back, <laughs> but it seems like you're, it's he actually helping your students. <laughs> um, so that, that's, that's really good to know. I'm glad, I'm glad I asked you because I was like really on the fence. Like, I don't know where this term came from, but it seems to be like a buzzword in all the, the news outlets, right? And so that's when I was like, all right, well, well, I'm being told not to listen to this, so therefore I think I should go into it. <laughs> yeah, let, let me get on the news. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, um. So, uh, yeah, how how do you manage your students? Because um, one of the questions I, I did want to ask you is like, that you have, as far as performance-wise, right? You have your top performing students and then your lowest performing students, right? And then with that, there might come certain behaviors, whether it's like attendance or it's rebellion. Like, how do you manage that as a teacher? Because I'm sure that's, that's it takes a lot out of you. So again, like I'm, I'm in, you know, just like the beauty of the universe and me being the teacher that I think my students need. You know, I love the kids that are the hardest. Like those are the heart students, right? Not the hard students, but the heart students. And those are the ones that um, I always have the most patience for because I can see myself in them so so often, you know, that I, I never want to give up on those kids because there's so many teachers that gave up on me. So I have, I definitely have a certain level of patience and a certain level of empathy for those kids. And so, um, you know, but I see, I see the potential in every single kid, you know, the same way I see the potential, I had to see the potential in myself. And that's been a journey in itself, right? To believe in myself. So, you know, I, I, I you know, I think I treat every student individually but i do believe they're all capable of getting to the same place it's just they may get there differently for a student uh, or for students who may not believe in themselves how do you get them to reach a point where they start seeing that hey i can do this or i'm capable of this like how do you get there because i think that's uh, that's very valuable so this is my favorite one of my favorite educational terms but it's the zone of proximal development and it's this notion of like 
you help people, you, you meet people where they're at, you meet people where they're comfortable at, and then you challenge them from there. I use the same theory when I DJ. It's like when I'm DJing, I play music that I feel like people are comfortable with so that I can take them somewhere else. But that's all it is. It's like everybody has different modalities, different ways of expressing their intelligence. So as a teacher, if I can understand my student and tap into what they're good at, then I can take them where they eventually need to go. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm incredibly fortunate to, you know, I play video games with my students. I play sports with my students. I have a lot of ways to get, you know, I, I share music with them. So I have a lot of ways in helping to affirm their, you know, their intelligence, their value, um, you know, and, and I think that goes a really, really, really long way in terms of students developing confidence in the classroom. So I'm hearing uh, <clears throat> one key thing that you're mentioning is, you're seeing students where they're at, um, not just like capability, but like who they are strength wise, right? So they feel acknowledged, they feel recognized in that sense. And mm -hmm. that gives you, that gives them a confidence like, hey, if I'm good at this thing, maybe I can apply this to something else, right? Or maybe I can grow forth from here, but at least um, they're being seen and not just forced into like, hey, you need to take this test. And if not, then you're a failure or something. Yeah, I, I've never given a test in my classroom. I've also, um, you know, I, I do give grades, but I don't care about grades. And, and I think they're just an arbitrary <laughs> idea. It's like, that's not it. That's not what it is. It's like, did you learn? You know, I don't need you to, you know, you know, I, I can measure a student's progress just by working with them. And I can measure things like their effort. You know, I don't need to have um, just a test that's like to because you scored a certain, you know, measurement on that test, regardless of everything that else is, that is happening in your life. You know, that's why standardized testing are hugely problematic. Yeah, I, I, uh, I learned something a while ago that like, or to support your um, statement that standardized, standardized testing is problematic, right? Is, you know, let's say if you ask a student, what's half of 13? And a lot of them might say like six and a half or 6.5 and so forth. And <clears throat> some of them might say four. And then according to the standardized method, um, they would be inaccurate, right? But if you talk to them more, meaning qualitative, right? Not standardized, yeah. you, might, you might be like, okay, well, this person said six and a half and 6.5, why did you say four? And then they'll be like, well, half of 13, 13 is eight, uh, uh, the word 13 is eight characters. Right, so half of thirteen is four, and, and and they're like, <clears throat> and you're like, whoa, like you actually answered the question in yeah. a way that was previously un unrecognizable, right? But they actually answered to the full degree, right? Yeah, right. So, and so it's amazing that um, it, amazing and unfortunate that a lot of um, those kind of students are probably getting like very under, underneath all this standardized crap, right? Yeah, no, it's, I mean, and, and they they've you know they've done tons of studies that, you know, standardized test scores like SATs are not a measurement of any sort of intelligence, their measurement of resources, you know, and, and it's pretty clear because, you know, you can take SAT test prep courses that cost a thousand dollars and you can score higher on your test, your SAT. That doesn't mean you're smarter. That just means you had access to a thousand dollars to take the test prep. And you probably had access to all kinds of other programs throughout that, your ex educational experience to help you score better on that test. That's not a measurement of intelligence, but this is the way the system is designed. And this is what, you know, it's, it's, to me, when we're having this conversation, it sounds like absolute garbage, but this is the system. And unfortunately, we're not having these conversations, you know, and, you know, one of the things that Jeff Duncan Andrade told me, um, who was the, the best teacher I had at San Francisco State University, he said, um, the school system is not broken, it's doing exactly what it's designed to do. <laughs> and when you have that awareness, it's like, oh, okay, it's not broken. It's just replicating the same results. And if you don't have a problem with that, then it's working. But I have a problem with that because I see the educational inequality um, and not just the educational inequality, but the income inequality. Um, and, uh, and, you know, if we don't, you know, education is like our greatest resource. It's our, it's like I said, it's been the passport for me in my life. So why shouldn't students have equal access, you know? And, you know, that's, that's why I do the work that I do. Yeah. What are your thoughts on homework? Meaning, uh, I think it was Finland or one of those uh, countries uh, overseas was like, yeah, we're, we're actually going to do away with homework or have very little of it, little of it, right? And then um, those students actually ended up becoming much more curious because they had like more playtime. They had they had time to go outside and interact and learn how to like investigate. You know, uh, that was their, their homework, so to speak. Whereas in America, it's like, yeah, homework, worksheets, and all this other stuff, which 
um, you know, it sounds like it, w- it will make sense, but uh, yeah. So I guess, yeah. What, what are your thoughts on homework? The only homework I ever uh, like assigned to students is just reading. That's it. Cause that's, that's the, that's education that can happen anywhere. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I agree with that. Like, um, you know, school students are in school long enough to be quite honest. And, you know, when they get home, I can't control any of the variables. And so knowing that my students come from different experiences and different backgrounds, like I grew up in a incredibly impoverished home where if I were asked to do homework, like how can I do that when I don't even get to go home after school because I, my, my dad lives um, in a different, or he works in a different city. He doesn't, I don't have a ride home. I don't live in the city that I go to school in because my parents can't afford to live here. There's all these different experiences that, you know, maybe you have to take care of your younger brothers and sisters because your mom's at work. Like, and I'm going to assign you homework and then penalize you if you don't do it. Like, nah, like make some time to read and that should be self-motivated. Um, and you know, and, and again, it's like, I haven't, I haven't, recognize a place where my students weren't achieving because I didn't assign them homework. So yeah. when I get off work, I don't want to do homework either. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what are some things that you do to nurture curiosity? Do you like present certain topics or you find a way to relate to the, what their interests are? Uh, completely. And I, like I said, I, the way that I've been approaching this school year is through the notion of epistemology, which is why do we know what we know? And I've been using that to, inform all of my curriculum this year. And I actually wrote down some of the things that we've been studying um, this year. I, I actually want to share it with you, the list. Yeah, but, please do. Um, we've been studying zoocosis. What is that? I That's like that the mental illness that animals experience in the zoo. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. You, you, know, like, you know how we have guinea pigs? Like, so apparently guinea pigs are very social creatures. Mm. And in some countries, it's they, they ban the sale of single guinea pigs. Because if you get a single one, uh, or yeah, single one, they require a lot of social interactions, and if they just by themselves, they get depression and they'll die early. Wow. Yeah. So that, that's that's a very that's a, that's a new uh, uh, understanding for me for sure. Well, part of that part of the motivation for talking about psychosis was to help students understand that humans are also animals and they experience the same sort of mental illnesses that we do. And then so if these animals are in cages and they're experiencing mental illness what kind of illnesses are we experiencing as a result of our society that has its own forms of cages? And that was like how we started the school year. <laughs> so absolutely based on curiosity, but um, anthropocentrism, propaganda, manifest destiny, oppression, xenophobia, Eurocentrism, gentrification, redlining, social Darwinism. Uh, we've talked about Fred Hampton, Tupac, Jay Dilla, Nipsey Hussle, Tecumseh, Kobe Bryant, Malcolm X, Sojourner Truth, Frederick Douglass, and we've watched It Man 1 and 2. We've watched Fist of Fury, Avatar, Princess Mononoke, Percy Jackson, and we're reading Ishmael right now. So this is, you know, in my English classes right now. Wow, that sounds amazing. I I, want to be in your classroom. (laughs) Yeah, no, I I, I like, I I get to learn alongside my students. And as I said, I, I want my students to have access to a college level education no matter where they're at. You know, and whether they're in ninth grade, I don't know if they're going to go to college. So, you know, I was having a lesson on gentrification and, you know, just the other day and my student was like, when am I going to use this word? And then he's from East Palo Alto. And I'm like, well, haven't you noticed rent going up in your neighborhood? He's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent. So like, I, I see that you're um, preparing them for the real world, right? The real world yeah. and what uh, <clears throat> what they're going to step into that. That's beyond like engineering or beyond doing your job. It's like, is this, 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 yeah, this is the real world right here. Yeah. I mean, I, I, Paulo Freire says we teach the word and the world and, you know, you can do both. And so I definitely teach academic language and academic literacy. Um, and I want my students to do well on their SATs because that's going to give them access to college. But at the same time, I'm like, I got to teach you about the world, or at least I got to make the world accessible to you within the classroom because you don't just live in this classroom. You live in the world and you need to be an informed citizen. You need to be able to make decisions and you need to understand what you're getting into, you know, and, and a huge part of, you know, what I, I look for, I didn't get it. I'm not doing this yet, but I can't wait to talk about social media with my students because that's a place where we're all existing right now. And like, that should be in the classroom. That's why I teach English. Cause I can, I can have that. I can have that class. Yeah, can can we get a preview of what you might talk or bring up for social media? I'm, I'm um, curious too. I mean, I haven't developed this, so you yeah, can yeah. ask me in a couple of weeks. But okay, uh, definitely, you know, 
getting their voices and understanding how they've been experiencing it. And, and, you know, you know, the interesting thing about my school right now is that, um, I'm teaching what's labeled as special ed, but it's special in the sense that, you know, it's not the, the, the general, like, um, issues that students would have in a special ed class. I'm dealing with a lot of students that have like anxiety and depression from the pandemic or students that, um, also are, you know, like I said, black and brown students being, you know, disproportionately diagnosed as special ed. I'm dealing with just a lot of students that are dealing with trauma. Um, and so, you know, for me to be able to talk about the things that are happening on social media and how it's influencing the way we see the world um, is going to be a huge part of it and how that affects the way we feel. Because even, you know, I can be completely vulnerable about like, um, you know, how I go in and out of social media. For people that follow me, um, they may notice that I, I kind of dip in and out of it because I have to take care of my own mental well-being. And so I know that there's something that's aloof about social media and the constant um, bombardment of, of, of the, you know, kind of feedback loop that we're in. And so um, just being able to have those conversations and, you know, there's great, there's great, you know, resources out already, like the social network and um, tons of articles about it. But it is really rooted in um, young people's experiences um, and also also, you know, being able to have these conversations about how it's affecting us globally, you know, because uh, even in places like China and Korea, they have like uh, probably social media, but for sure they have video game like addiction boot camp. And, you know, that's that's China some, definitely does. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, and, and, and video game addiction is definitely something that we're experiencing with kids right now, um, you know. Yeah, you know, you know like speaking as a uh, survivor of video games, <laughs> uh, when when World of Warcraft first came out, man, I, I call that um, the dark ages of my life, where like, uh, <laughs> like I, 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 I full disclaimer, <laughs> I, I'm no longer an addict. <laughs> but when when it first came out, I, I played like, um, I started playing this. Like that one week after it launched, right? And I played straight for like four or five years. Oh my gosh. And I remember there was times when uh, my friends would come pick it, pick me up to, you know, we go out clubbing or dancing or whatever it is, that, that outdoor activity, right? They're like, hey, Vin, we're outside. And I'm like, hey, um, can you wait? They're like, why? Why, why do you have to wait? We're outside. It was like, I'm in, I'm in the middle of a raid, you know? Damn. <laughs> and then how it's set up, it's like, within the social construct of those games, if you leave your party, like you get, you get a lot of grief later on. <laughs> yeah. 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 That, I mean, that part. Um, and, and I think that's the thing, like students, you know, being able to diagnose it as an addiction because we, we've kind of been living in this world without, you know, kind of the wild west when it comes to social media and video games to a degree. And, now we're starting to get some like longitudinal studies about the effects and um, you know the kind of anxieties that it's creating for young folks and especially you know issues around body image and 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 comparison you know and you know it's not a healthy thing for any of us to be you know consuming as often as most of us do um, but especially for young folks where their brains are developing their ways that they're seeing the world. Yeah, I I feel very fortunate to. And proud to have grown up in a time where, like, I, th I think I'm uh, maybe us both are like in the hybrid between the digital and the analog world. We're kind of the bridge, in my opinion. Are we called the Xennials or something, uh, something like that? Yeah. Where, but it's true. We we are a really unique, uh, yeah, really unique generation of of humans right now. Because, you know, I did talk to my students one day. I was like, "Do you guys ever play outside?" They're like, "What's that?" <laughs> <laughs> and that that like literally blew my mind because I, I mean obviously like you and I probably remember playing outside until the street lights went on or or beyond. Yeah, in, and, uh, back when I used to live in Vietnam, like I, I even played outside in the rain. Yeah, like, like it, was, it was a common thing. Like when it rains, everyone's like, "Oh yeah, great rain, let's go play outside and run around in shorts." And then there, there might be flooding here and there, but it's all good, you know. Right. But now like. You look outside, you're like, oh, it's really nice. I'm going to go on TV. <laughs> yeah. Like, well, I, I was well, like uh, living near my near, my niece uh, last year and seeing her having like drama with her girlfriends on social media or on, on, on games online. And it's like, yo, we never had that. Like, so, you know, we're and in and, and that way it can be even more insidious, unfortunately. Um, and so having the conversations, especially with my students who, you know, are experiencing anxiety and depression and. Um, you know, I teach in a, you know, a, 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 a school district where suicide is actually a really prevalent issue. And so obviously social media is an, an influence on that. So why are we not talking about that in classrooms? Um, so, you know, I, I, I absolutely 
treat my classroom as a space to unpack what's happening in the world. And if I don't, you know, if I don't offer that, I don't know where else students have to go sometimes. So I have to ask, like, what are some things that you do to maintain maintain your well being, especially being a teacher? Because I'm <laughs> I'm sure, like, uh, I can only imagine like taking on the uh, responsibilities of handling so many students with different needs, and then um, I can see it being easy or natural to start internalizing their successes and failures as possibly your own, you know? Mm. So like, how do you, how, how do you maintain your own well being this uh, this despite all that? I mean, it's constantly challenging. I, I think the good thing is I have pretty solid coping mechanisms, and I. Um, I mean, I'm grateful. I've been, I've been an athlete most of my life, so I still continue to work out once or twice a day. And, you know, I, I started working out with my students. Um, I created a, a physical training class because I felt like they needed it. I was like, yo, you guys come to school and you guys aren't, um, you guys aren't getting it. Like your, your, your body's connected to your mind. Like, let's make sure our bodies are strong as well. And that's part of the way I've been teaching them discipline and, you know, um, consistency but you know i teach that because i want to do that i'm like when i get to school i, I ride my bike um I, I, a combination of riding my bike and taking the train for two hours each day so i'm getting a lot of exercise which i think benefits me uh in a, in a lot of ways but like i said with my students i'm stretching with them um i would take meditation breaks with my students all the time um you know if i'm feeling a certain way like yo i'm a little overwhelmed my students know like let's drop into a meditation and I, I mean, I, I, that's why I say I love my job because I'm literally able to, you know, be my best self with these students and, and practice, you know, practice the habits to, to leading me to my best self with my students. And, you know, I, the greatest thing about being a teacher is that I've never had a question if I was doing the right thing in my life. I know a lot of, you know, especially when you get to my age, a lot of, a lot of professionals are like, Hey, what, am I doing the right thing? Like, you know, this is what I thought I wanted. Um, but I know every day I go to school and I'm, I'm making a difference and, um, you know, I'm in service of others. And so that for my, my overall well being absolutely helps. I don't go home and, and lose any sleep over that. I lose sleep over what I'm going to do in class the next day, but I never lose sleep about, you know, where, who I am in the world right now, because I'm, I, I know I'm doing important work. I'm really glad you feel that way. Cause like, I couldn't agree more. And, um, uh, so I am curious about like, what are some things, uh, that you would say you learn from your students or that they change your mind on? I tailor my my classroom so much to what their interests are that I constantly am learning with them. Like I said, like recognize. So the cool thing about teaching ethnic studies and the reason why there's no standardized curriculum for ethnic studies is because you couldn't teach ethnic studies the same way in Oakland as you would in New Mexico, as you would in Seattle, as you would in New York, because ethnic studies is completely rooted in the student body is rooted in what those students need. So when I was teaching ethnic studies in LA, most of my students were from Central America. So I was like, yo, I gotta, I can't just teach them my version of ethnic studies. I need to teach them the ethnic studies that is rooted in their culture. And so I was learning so much through that experience. Um, and, you know, um, you know, just this year, like I didn't expect to come into the classroom and, and teach Ip Man and Bruce Lee, but you know, one of my students showed an interest in it and he was a student that wasn't coming to school. And I was like, well, you showed me enough to tell me that you like that movie. I'm going to bring that in the classroom and I'm going to help intellectualize it for you, but I'm going to get to learn about it alongside with you. And we're, you know, like we're, we're kind of sharing the journey together. So it's been, you know, that's, I, I, I'm learning every single day in my job. Um, and I, I get to read great books, you know, like I'm reading the Nipsey Hussle autobiography with some of my students and, Um, you know, I don't know if I'd have time to read that book, but you know, some of my students have interest in it and I'm like, yeah, let's go, you know? And so, um, it's a constant thing, but, um, also just learning, you know, from them in, in, in the social emotional ways of how they deal with the world, how they see the world, having empathy, you know, like I have students that are, this is, this is a trip. Um, this is the first year I've experienced this, but you know, I do teach special ed. So I have students that have, um, you know, obviously autism, um, ADHD, but I have a student that's a paraplegic, (laughs) you know, and I have the full range of students that I'm working with. And so, you know, one of my students that, you know, is paraplegic, like I work with him and I'm just learning gratitude. I'm learning to be grateful for me being an able-bodied person that is able to go to work and teach and the opportunity to even just work with him. Um, and so I, I'm, I get to have these really um, close relationships with my students and I, I, I learn from them just the experiences that they're having 
I absolutely, you know, kind of, uh, yeah, I take, I take a lot of that in sometimes. So, you know, mad respect for, uh, you being in a space where you can see these, I guess, differences <coughs> or maybe even challenges as like a, um, uh, teaching moment rather than a frustration. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's been, it's been a, a beautiful journey. Like I said, the, the students that are the most challenging are the ones that I, I remember the most, you know, and I remember this kid a couple of years ago, he hated me. <laughs> what, what, what did he hate about you? Was it like, cause I would challenge him. Okay. Cause I didn't let him get, a, get away with all his shit. And I, <laughs> I, he hated me for that. And I would call him out and I'd let him know when he was being an asshole. And, uh, you know, but by the end of the school year, he was like, he was thanking me so much and he, and he had so much, he's like, I just want to let you know, like, I respect you so much. And, yeah. Do you, do you think uh, he felt seen by you calling him out versus like just kind of pushing him to the side? Yeah, because I see, I saw his potential, and I see every kid's potential. I see every single kid's potential. I'm I'm grateful that I haven't reached a point in my career where I don't see that in kids. I see every kid's potential, no matter how where they're at, no matter how much of an asshole they can be. Sometimes I always see their potential, and with this kid, like everybody had given up on him. They're like, oh, that kid's helpless. Like his family's jacked up. He's he jacked up. His brothers were the same way. And I was like, nah, like I'm going to be hard on that kid because he needs high expectations. All y'all are giving up on him. And, you know, he was able to, you know, make it through eighth grade. And and like I said, he, you know, it meant so much to to have him come up to me at the end of the year. And, and you know, you don't often get that. But, <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, it's one of those those situations where you know that you're you're doing the right thing and you you literally made an impact on someone's life. Amazing. I love it. Let's, let's, uh, jump over to your artistic musical career <laughs> and then, uh, you know, whether we want to talk about DJing life or soul source in particular. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love soul source. It's yeah. Like, yeah. So, <laughs> like, uh, I'm not sure if this story has been unpacked yet, but yeah, tell me all about soul source, man. Ah, uh, so soul source. Well, I think I should tell you, well, first of all, thank you for throwing soul source. Cause I always have a good time when I go. So, I'm glad. I mean, for it's, anyone it's, who hasn't gone, uh, it's usually in LA, uh, definitely go soul source. I'm sure you can find it if you search on uh, Google or Facebook. Yeah, it's, 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 it's our baby, Carlos, Mr. Chalk, Mantron, it's our baby. Um, and, uh, I mean, I think I should, I should share why I got into DJing to, to kind of fully understand why soul source exists today okay. for me. Um, yeah. So soul source, I mean, I, as I, as I was saying, like, wanted to start with the story of how I became, how I got into DJing. And, um, you know, my father, my, both my parents were musicians. Um, that's the part that I, I, I want to acknowledge as well. My mother, um, you know, as I mentioned, being adopted from China, from Hong Kong, she, um, she did study, uh, classical guitar and play the accordion, um, in high school. And so she had a pretty, you know, um, robust musical background. And then my father was, um, a drummer and, uh, he was actually a drummer for the late Tina Marie, which I'm not sure if you know who that oh, is. Really? Yeah. So that was m my DNA. That was how I understood music was through my father being a dancer as well. My father was a, a really well-known dancer. Um, um, back at home in Mississippi and, but he was also known as a phenomenal drummer. And, uh, you know, so when I was growing up, it was like, you know, listening to my father sort of, um, you know, he didn't, he didn't play in the band when uh, I was growing up, but he would constantly be drumming on tables and, and, you know, car steering wheels and in the kitchen with, with a pair of spoons. And, you know, that was sort of my musical memory of, of, of music and beats and drumming. When I went to college, um, you know, I had been studying hip hop in, intensely, like voracious um, consumer of hip hop music. And, you know, um, I started doing radio for the University of Hawaii. And uh, I remember that just being like, you know, I only did it for a short period. It was like during my senior year when I was also taking eight classes and I had a um, you know, one thing in my life is I've just always been incredibly busy. <laughs> so that's why I'm teaching and, and DJing full time as well, um, or DJing doing, doing projects like soul source as well. But, uh, I was, I was doing college radio and I remember this feeling of, um, you know, when I would play music, this kind of spirit would come over me and, you know, it was something I never felt in any other aspects of my life. But I remember like, um, 
doing my last show before I moved to Japan. And uh, I was like, damn, I'm really going to miss doing radio. Like, I need to get back to this someday. So, you know, um, you know, when I'm living in uh, Asia, I, I took another sort of, you know, I took another, you know, route in my life. I left Hawaii and I moved to Asia and I was living in Taiwan, uh, you know, a few years later. And I remember going to a club and, uh, you know, hearing, you know, the hip hop that they were playing in, in Taiwan at the time. And it was probably like Nelly and, you know, Chingy and stuff of that variety. Just not very creative, not very intellectual, um, not very inspiring hip hop, in my opinion. And feeling very like frustrated by it because I'd be like, yo, like they need to play some better music. So that was part of it. Like, yo, I just want to play better music when I go to the clubs. But I was also, um, you know, teaching in Taiwan. And, and when I first moved to Taiwan, I went to work for this company called Hess, which is kind of like the McDonald's of English schools in Taiwan. There's like thousands of them and they hire all kinds of people and they have a very scripted curriculum. And so I'm teaching kindergarten. And one of the lessons I had, this is why I'm, I'm so cavalier as a teacher today is because one of the lessons I had was I had to teach my students that, oh, the, uh, the police are, are here to protect us and the military is our friends. And going back to the story I had about police brutality, you know, I, I had a very visceral feeling about teaching that. I was like, I can't teach these lies. And it doesn't matter that they're kindergartners in Taiwan. Like, this is not speaking to my soul. So I had to leave. And um, I remember um, pretty desperate to, to find a new job because I was living in Taiwan. I was there by myself. I didn't, you know, I was like, if I quit this job, I'm just kind of out here. So there was a a, um, a foreign school, or international school that was hiring and um I knew someone there through playing basketball that I knew someone that taught there through playing basketball. And I was like, Oh, yo, like your school's hiring. Like, can I, can I apply? And he's like, yeah, like send me your resume. So I sent over my resume. I've, I've already, I was the director of uh, kindergarten programming at the YMCA in San Francisco prior to moving to Taiwan. I already had a master's degree in education. I was, you know, honor roll in, in, in um, doing my bachelor's. And so the school sees my resume and they're like, Oh, bring this teacher on. He's dope. The other teacher gives them one caveat. He says, oh, I just want to mention that he's black. And they're like, no. So they wouldn't even interview me because they were worried about the perception um, that the other students or the parents would have of having a black English teacher. And I'm over here just trying to survive. I'm like, I can't teach at this other school. I need to find another job. This one is not going to hire me because I'm black. And I was in such a desperate place, I remember writing a letter to the administration there, essentially apologizing for being a black person that was applying for the job. Please, can you hire me in spite of the color of my skin? I ended up getting the job. And I was so hurt by that, but I like wanted to live in Taiwan and I wanted to, you know, fulfill this, you know, this this travel bug that I had. So I stayed and I took the job and I kind of, you know, uh, swallowed my pride. But I did notice a connection between, okay, this is how I'm being perceived in this country when I try to apply for a job. And at the same time, this is the music that's being presented for my culture. So no wonder people feel a certain way about black people if this is the only experience that they're having with black people. And so I realized at that moment that I think I want to DJ because we need better representation. And again, you know, so many of the musical forms that we're playing these days throughout the world, they are rooted in black culture. But unfortunately, black people are not always the ones that are playing the music. And even if they are, you know, non-black people are not having to deal with the consequences of what that constant image of blackness that's being represented is portraying to the rest of the world. So I felt like I just had to become a DJ just to be somebody that could push against that. Um, and, uh, you know, so when I went to graduate school, that's when I, I, I started, uh, thinking more deeply about DJing. I actually, um, I remember I went to, I, I did my second master's at UC Santa Cruz and I'll, I'll never forget this part either. I was in my first semester there and, um, 
the same day classes started, I went to a record shop and I bought 200 records. <laughs> I still have the picture of a crate of 200 records and the bus to UC Santa Cruz coming to pick me up with my records. <laughs> and that was the moment that I was like, I'm going to become a DJ. Um, but that was further propelled. Like my, my father died about a year later. My father, who was a drummer, um, you know, when he died, I was like, oh, what do I do? How do I make sense of life without my father here? And I just remember that night that he died sitting in my apartment and I just put on records that he would listen to. And it was like, okay, he's still here. And that is what made me a DJ. Um, I think about my dad every time I DJ. So... Going to Soul Source, um, yeah, it's a it's a continuation of that. The representation, the soul of music that I felt from my father, um, and Carlos. <clears throat> sorry, I'm getting choked up again. I knew this was going to be hard, um, but yeah, Carlos, bless 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 his heart, Carlos is someone that I met through the dance community through open house. And, uh, yeah, he just, yeah, uh, unquestionably good person. I couldn't be happier to work with that man. Um, and he's such a, he's such a student of like dance. And I, I'm not, I mean, I, I danced when I was, when I was younger, but I don't consider myself a dancer. I, um, but Carlos is a dancer. Carlos is a tremendous dancer and he's a tremendous human. And he is such a student of dance that he was able to connect so many different communities. You know, we met through Open House, but Carlos has been working in so many dance communities. He knows he's friends with the popping community and the locking community. And he took tap dance and uh, he's, he was a B-boy. Like he knows so many people. So, you know, when we talked about doing a party together, it was definitely about unifying the dance communities um, and unifying the musical community just like in terms of the different genres that we play because it never made sense to me to go to a party just to hear hip hop or just to hear house. I mean, no, no shade on the parties that do that. But for me, I, I, have, I have so much curiosity about music that I never wanted to be limited to uh, just one, one BPM, one genre, one, one tempo. And I think people are experiencing uh, music in, you know, they're just coming at it from so many different places. So there's always a time to play, you know, beats or house music or hip hop or jazz or slow jams. I, I love playing slow jams personally, but that's where Soul Source comes from. It's, it's this, you know, this diversity of um, people, the diversity of sounds. Um, and when I came back to living in the United States after, <clears throat> being in Asia for a while, I would go to the successful parties in LA and I would, you know, I would see who was there. And I told myself I didn't want to, I didn't think that the, I, the sort of definition of a successful party in LA should mean that it has to be gentrified. I really have been incredibly intentional about soul source being not so much focused on progress, but almost like digression, like getting back to what the culture was, getting back to what the music was, getting back to what the, the community was. And so the community that created house and hip hop and these, these jazz and these, these, these art forms, like, you know, they need a space to deal with the frustrations that they're dealing with today, you know? And Soul Source to me, when I really boil it down, it's on Sunday because it's a church. That's how I see it. It's its its, its own kind of church. And uh, the uh, the greatest compliment that I ever get about Soul Source, and it happens quite frequently, was when someone tells me that it's been healing for them. It's like, dope. I'll keep doing it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Soul Source is great. Um, <clears throat> it's been challenging. I, I moved to the Bay Area and... Uh, you know, I left LA and I, I definitely miss the community. I miss the work I was doing there. I miss the people that I was working with. Um, but the beautiful thing is that Soul Source is very much 
still alive. Um, you know, Carlos and Mr. Chalk and Mantron are hella holding it down and we're doing a New Year's Eve party in, in a couple of weeks and I couldn't be more excited to travel down for that. Um, but also Soul Source is, we're going to continue to develop here in the Bay Area. Um, you know, when I left LA, I, I felt, I was sad. <laughs> um, you can tell how, <clears throat> how emotional I can get about life and I was sad to leave LA. <laughs> I had built so much there and uh, to feel like I, I left, you know, economics, it was like economics. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't have the same quality of life as a teacher in LA, unfortunately. So I had to move and, and fortunately I've, I've lived in the Bay area. Um, so it is like kind of coming back home, but, uh, I was heartbroken to leave LA after we put in so much work, four years of, of building Soul Source, and it's been my dream. I've I've never been a part of something that I mean it's 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 actually so much further than what I ever dreamed was possible, and at the same time we're just beginning. Um, so to leave it was was hard, um, but I had to do what was best for myself, and I think I believe that coming to the Bay Area, it's been about building a bridge. And so I've been really fortunate that the Bay Area has started to um, started to invite me to their events and accept me and appreciate me. And it, you know, it, it's it feels it feels wonderful. Like it is a global community that we're a part of as as dancers and as DJs. And you know, um, I do expect to continue building Soul Source here in the Bay Area. And you know, and, and again, it's always about what can I contribute to the to the community. I, I I've been living out here for like five or six months now. And I, I never was like, yo, I moved to the Bay, like book me for your parties. I didn't, I never reached out to anybody. I've just been out here and uh, just kind of acclimating. But, you know, I've always just felt like if I'm going to DJ here, then I want to contribute to the community. And um, yeah, fortunately, you know, we're in a space to to start, you know, we're going to start a session, a soul source session in the Bay. Uh, my girlfriend and I, Gwen, um, who's also an amazing DJ who's been coming into our own, you know, I, I, my partner's a DJ and, and it's, it's been wonderful to have that experience where we're both part of the house community, the dance community, and, uh, to be able to, um, you know, create something together through our, through our own passions and our own in interest. And, uh, you know, I've been, like I said, I've been not focusing on leaving LA as a, as a, you know, sort of as in a deficit mindset, but more so thinking about the ways that, uh, that soul source will grow and, and we'll build a bridge through from the Bay to LA and hopefully to other cities, hopefully back to Hawaii, hopefully, you know, wherever, wherever the music takes us. Um, you know, people from around the world have attended soul source and they've told me, told me and Carlos that it's a really special place. Um, and I, I, I don't take that lightly. I, I know that if people are coming from, you know, France and, you know, um, you know, other places in Europe, you know, other parts of South America, Central America, that what we have really is unique. And, you know, the beautiful thing about Soul Source, like, like I said, is it's diversity. It's the diversity of dancers, it's the diversity of cultures, it's multi-generational, you know, um, it's something that I think, you know, I'm grateful that it exists. And I, I feel like we're so privileged to live in cities like LA or Oakland, where, we have spaces to create, you know, not just parties, but I think movements um, that are rooted in, in in the community. So, so I have to ask, where, where does the name Soul Source come from, and and is that the the final form of the the idea, or did it was it known under any other aliases before? Well, well, I mean, again, um, you know, I, I want to say that Soul Source is just a evolution of so many of the projects that we've already been working on. Um, you know, specifically myself, I was a DJ for Open House. I, you know, I still consider myself a DJ for Open House, and I was working with that community for nearly ten years. And I was working with one two one two one two sessions. I was, um, you know, I started a party when I first moved to Riverside called Elbow Grease. And you know, I've always been kind of working in the dance communities. Um, and so Soul Source is just the latest iteration. Um, but Soul Source, the name itself, comes from a Japanese record label that actually does, um, creates like uh, modern soul, soul records. And, um, you know, the thing that 
that I think, you know, we could have a whole other conversation about DJing um, specifically, but uh, I do know that the thing that makes me special as a DJ is that I, I never skipped any steps, you know, in the sense that, you know, I was really intentional about that. You know, I think today it's, it's pretty, pretty, you know, convenient to become a DJ. It's much more convenient than it was before when, you know, entry point was just, the barriers were so much higher with equipment and, you know, records themselves. Um, but I was very fortunate that, um, like I said, after I was living in Taiwan, I had a friend that let me borrow his, uh, borrow his turntables, shout out Predacon, um, shout out Larry, man. He, he also changed my life. He was fundamental in me becoming a DJ because at the time I was a grad student, I couldn't afford it two techniques and a mixer, but luckily my friend had a pair I could borrow. But I went into record collecting in a in a, an obsessive way. Um, and I think that's where, you know, I think that's what kind of separates our sound and my uh, my curation of the event because I, I've, you know, even though I started, I didn't start DJing until I was 30 years old or 29, um, so quite late to be honest. And I've been doing it 10 years now. Um, and, uh, you know, but I didn't skip steps. I didn't, I didn't just rush to digital or Serato. I, I definitely wanted to take the time to learn the craft. And it's the same with dance. Like if you have a strong foundation, then ultimately you're going to get further. And I think that's, you know, again, that's, that's kind of the advice that I have for any DJs that are coming up, like respect the craft like learn from, learn from the masters. Like I've been fortunate to know Mr. Chalk. He's been a mentor to me. Um, he was my, well, he was, yeah, my, I was, I was, I was kind of self-taught with DJing, but Mr. Chalk, when I moved to LA, I was able to work with him at Scratch Academy. I, I wasn't even working with him that much at Beat Junkies Institute. I worked with him at Scratch Academy when I first moved out there. And, um, you know, he taught me some of the fundamentals and, and the fact that I work with Mr. Chalk now on Soul Source, I mean, that's a dream come true. I mean, this is a, a you know, a legend in, in DJing. Um, he was a, a member of the Fantastic Four. He's a Power 106 DJ. You know, most hip hop heads grew up listening to Mr. Chalk um, in LA. And the fact that, you know, you know, I was listening to him and other B Jankies like 20 years ago. I remember just religiously listening to those tapes, J-Rock, Ratmatic, like Melody, all these cats, um, you know, Babu. And, and, you know, they were the authors <laughs> of so much of the music that I was listening to at the time because they were putting out mixtapes. And to be able to work with Mr. Chalk and to know these DJs now, it's like I'm I'm absolutely living a dream right now doing Soul Source. It's it's mind boggling to me. What what are um are the roles that everyone has in there within Soul Source? Like you, Carlos, and Mr. Chalk. So Mr. Chalk is our OG, you know, and and I love that the story of Soul Source with when it relates to Mr. Chalk is that he didn't join us to like almost a year. I think he officially joined us on our one year anniversary, but Mr. Chalk was there at our first event when we first started, when we may have had 20 people there. And that meant so much that, you know, this is a you know world-renowned DJ that came to our little two-bit party and he was showing support since day one. Um, Chalk and I actually had talked about doing a party previous to Soul Source, but I kind of told him, like, I think I have something coming with Carlos. And then we we ended up eventually linking up. But um, so Carlos is, I mean, Chalk is like the OG. He hosts the party. Um, and, you know, unfortunately he wasn't there last month and I, I was hella missing him. I was like, man, I need my, I need my dude here. Um, but he's, he's an OG, you know, he's, he's a, he's a legendary party rocker. And um, so he's kind of like the uncle, you know, he's the uncle for us and he, he kind of just holds us down. Um, Carlos is the dancer. Carlos is the dancer and the promoter. And, uh, you know, I, you know, rest in peace to Voodoo Ray, rest in peace to Voodoo Ray, but I, I, I definitely see a little bit of, of, of Carlos in, in that, in terms of his role, like, you know, he's the connector. Um, and Keon Mantron just joined us um, when I moved to the Bay. He, he joined us a few months ago, but he's always been kind of like part of the movement as well. And he's, he's kind of like our, our, our technician, I, I would say. He's the, he's the scientist. So he helps us with equipment. Um, he's also, he, he works with, with Boombox. He works with a lot of different um, parties in LA. And, uh, and Keon and I, Mantron, we met when we were doing, he was doing electric relaxation, uh, which is a party that he started with um, kind of like future beats and bass and like house music. And we were just like, yo, when we first started DJing together, we we're like, yo, like when I, when I met him, I was like, I don't know anybody that digs as hard as I do. And Keon's the one. 
I, and that's a real thing. Like I, there's a lot of DJs that don't dig like, you know, they dig or they just like, they kind of bite off people's stuff. And it's the same. It's the same with, with dance and everything. It's competitive. Right. But you know, you definitely recognize the people that are doing the work. And so I've always respected Keon because he hella does the work. And so we were inevitably supposed to work, work together, I think. And so he joined us with SoulSource when, um, when I decided to move. And then for me, I mean, I, I, I'm a DJ, I'm, I'm the resident DJ. Um, and I do think that like, um, I, I do a lot of the booking, I do a lot of the communication. Um, and you know, I, I feel like it is kind of my baby. Like I've been, you know, um, I've just been, I've been so invested in it. And, you know, you know, Carlos and I, who started it, like we've just worked so hard at creating this and, you know, it's hard for us to take credit for what it is though. I, I have to admit, because, you know, like I said, it is built on the backs of things like one, two, one, two sessions and open house and all these other dance movements that have been in existence in LA homeland. Um, and so all we're doing is I tell people all the time is like, we didn't build this ship. All we're doing is driving it right now. And, um, you know, we're sailing it and we're doing the best we can and we're learning every time we do an event and, you know, the, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy. We've been kind of a free party, um, for most of our existence. You know, we've, you know, I, I probably lost <laughs> not, not a ton of money, but I've lost, it's an investment and it's an investment that I've been privileged to be able to make for the community. But I don't think about that. I don't care about that because I know that it's, it's healing. I know that it's church for people. So I have no problem um, you know, giving my time and my energy to that, to that movement. So, yeah, in a way it's, um, community service, right? Doing, doing stuff yeah, that yeah. you really, really love. Have you or Carlos or yeah, just ever entertain the thoughts of like going full time with it, meaning, um, using it as a form of income or as like, a, like your full time career, so to speak. I mean, I've been privileged to not have to think about DJing in that way. Mm -hmm. Um, that's, I mean, I'm, I'm so privileged that I've had, you know, I've had a full-time job while I've been DJing. So it's, I've always been able to approach it as art. Yeah. And um, I don't think I'd like it if I had to approach it in that way, to be honest. Um, I get so much joy from it just being what it is. And, you know, I definitely want it to grow. Um, what, we, what, we, what we want to see happen is, you know, part of the reason why we created a, a, a party in a club was because I think that dance was, a lot of what we were doing was dance sessions. And I think that the context that dancers were learning and experiencing these movements and these cultures was specific to dance sessions and classes and YouTube videos. And if you don't re remember that these things started in parties and clubs, it completely decontextualizes it. So we were like, well, our job now is to create a party. Um, but I don't necessarily like doing it at a, at a club because the hardest thing about doing a party for dancers is that if it's at a club, our income, our revenue is generated through drink sales. And as we know, dancers aren't the biggest drinkers. And I, I don't want to look at my friends or colleagues at the community as measuring them through the amount that they support the bar. Like I do want them to support the bar because that's part of the community, but I don't want to like look at them as customers. I want them to come enjoy themselves. They decide to, you know, spend money at the bar. That's great. But, you know, so what we want to do eventually is, is make it an outdoor event. And I, I do think that that's where we're evolving, um, for sure, where it can be free, hopefully. Um, but definitely all ages is the, is the move because as we're getting older, like our, our communities, they're having kids and they should have the opportunity to be in those spaces as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, have you ever attended the, uh, the Fort Greene parties in, in New York? I haven't, but you know, that's, that's literally the the model of, of what we want. Yeah, to create. I, I, uh, like the thing that I love about New York and love about those events over there is it's clearly a lifestyle. It's generational, you know, right. like when you go to the Fort Greene parties, you'll see like the elders dance with the babies, the right. babies jump in the circle and it's like, they're passing it on very organically. Right. right. So I'm definitely, um, with you on the, it, it, there is value in being outdoors and all ages. Right. Um, because I, I think that that's how a culture really truly grows. It's not just like, hey, when you're 18, you can get to this <laughs> yeah, class, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, facts. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay, great. Um, thank you for sharing everything that you have so far. Any 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 shout outs you'd like to mention or any fun facts and achievements you'd like to share? Um, well, I just want to shout out my mom. Like I, I you know, I, I just saw her last week and uh, I was in Hawaii and, <clears throat> 
Yeah. I mean, like I said, reflecting on what brought me to this moment, um, you know, it just made me really show a lot of gratitude for her journey. And, you know, I can't imagine what it is to be an orphan and to kind of be discarded, you know, from the world in a way and to be able to persevere through that and, and then to raise three, three boys in a new country with a black husband. And, you know, my, my, my father's not here anymore, but my mother's here. So I just want to thank her and, and give her praise. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I just want to thank you, man. Like, I, I want to thank you for giving me the, the opportunity to share my stories and and for all the all the guests that you've had on this show. I mean, you've had you know incredible community um, members and uh, and yeah, I think you, you're also doing really powerful work, man. And I, I just want to acknowledge that. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, it, it's good to be uh, sharing this journey with everybody. You know, because I, I realize. Uh, no matter how big or small the cog is, like just just play your part and then do, do your best. Is what is what I'm, I'm kind of simplifying my life into. <laughs> yeah, man. So, yeah, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, man, I I did want to say that, you know, one of the things I've been learning through my journey um, has been just trusting trusting your intuition. I think that that's the advice I could give to people, and that's definitely played a role in you know me kind of going all along this path and then falling off the path. And then appreciating it when I'm back on the path. And I definitely feel like I'm on the right path, like literally being here with you in this moment, being in the Bay Area. I'm looking forward to what um, what happens here, what what I create, what kind of impact I can make. And, uh, you know, the things that even though it feels like I give a lot um, to the community, like it also gives a lot to me. So I, I just want to acknowledge that it's it's a two way street as well. So. Yeah, for sure. You know, like I think one of the things I have, uh, two things I have. One is a BS meter, and one is a authentic <laughs> meter. Authentic meter, right? So I, my authentic meter for you is very, very high. You know, just, just so you know. Um, so I definitely want to uh, appreciate and um, give my my gratitude for all the work that you, you've done. Even though like I may not be in your classroom, but I love the idea that there's a passionate teacher out there that's so <laughs> invested into his students. Uh, cause you remember my, my teaching experience was like, yeah, here's donuts, uh, <laughs> for, for your rehearsal and now transformed to like what you're doing, which is I'm going to like learn about my students. I'm going to like share it in their journey and kind of like, uh, see how you can present these difficult topics in the way that they understand. That takes a lot of work. That's, that's like some extra mile, like, uh, energy, you know, that that's not like, <laughs> like that, that's beyond bare minimum. Right. Uh, yeah. Don't get it because I also give my students donuts and Kit Kats, <laughs> but it's not in lieu of their education. It's it's in as a supplement. <laughs> so, so, so once again, I guess that's the commonality there, right? Donuts. <laughs> yeah, I mean, kids like sugar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, wow, amazing. Um, so, uh, any last uh, closing remarks? Whether it's like um, people out in the journey, or if, like students, or maybe even adults who's uh, <coughs> lost touch with being curious. You know, like what what, what do you what do you have to say? I mean, again, I think it's, it's that, that notion of intuition, you know, like, cause I feel lost. I felt lost at many points in my life and, and I'm grateful to kind of, like I said, be back on the path. And, and that's the thing I think I noticed at a very young age was like, I, I noticed when things, as you mentioned, like the BS meter, I knew when things were just kind of off and it didn't matter how, how off it felt to the rest of society. If it felt off to me, like I, I, I wasn't. I couldn't be about that. It's kind of like when I, I had to choose between buying the locks album and the common sense album is like, Oh, I need to follow that path. So every time I've done that, it's, it's really led me to the right place. And, you know, I think that we all have an intuition and it's important for us to tap into that as often as we can. And, you know, we're always going to be presented with, you know, decisions and, and choices. And, you know, the truth is we're always one choice away from a completely different life. Like had I not moved to Hawaii, had I gone to, to prom with Taisha Miller, like all these things have an impact. You'll never know if you made the right decision. The thing that you can do is just trust your intuition. And even if it ends up being the quote unquote wrong decision, like you learn from that, you know, you learn from what it felt like. Did you have questions about that choice? What did you learn about what, what became of that consequence? Um, and yeah, we're just all out here learning. And, and that's the beautiful thing about, about being alive. And I never like focus on, yeah, you know, my life is incredibly busy right now and, and in some ways hard, you know, but I try to be rooted in gratitude and, and remind myself that I get to do all these things, you know, like I, you know, I, the, the, like I said, the hardest thing for me right now is the commute. And, uh, you know, actually this week I had a bike accident and I, I flipped over my handlebars and, and I, it was 
it was bad. It was like a couple of days ago and I'm, I'm here and I, I can't help but be grateful that, you know, for whatever reason, I, I still, you know, I still get to breathe. I still get to exist. I still get to hopefully make an impact. And, um, you know, like I said, I don't know how long we'll be here, any of us. So it's about having gratitude for the time that we have and trying to make the world a better place while we can. So. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I definitely want to um, second what you said on intuition. You know, I think house music and the house culture was the first time I learned how to listen to my intuition. Or I learned that I had intuition because uh, through the house culture, I saw that, okay, this music is bringing people together and they're like doing something that's that I never knew existed before. You know, um, as far as the diversity thing, like the house culture taught me like, oh yeah, what we, what we want in the, our legislation or government, this thing already exists here. There's like, mm. it can be any gender, any uh, color, any like age, yeah. and then it's, it's already happening, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so definitely, um, uh, Agree, agree with you there and thank you so much for coming on the show once again uh, hopefully you'll be on here again yeah I would love to thank you so much for having me Finn yeah it was a pleasure yep